Good morning, everyone. It's uh, November 10th, 2021. I'd like to call the business meeting of the South Florida Water Management District Governing Board to order. Uh, as most of you know, our, our usual meetings are on Thursdays. We're having our meeting on Wednesday this month um, in appreciation and celebration of Veterans Day tomorrow. Uh, we're now going to go to the Pledge of Allegiance. As we do, I'd like to thank uh, our Governing Board Member Colonel Roman for her service in the military, plus all the uh, men and women of the district who have served. And I'd like to ask uh, Colonel Jamie Booth if he would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this morning. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic, of the republic which stands, one nation, under God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all, and thank you, Colonel Booth. Uh, let's do a roll call and see who we've got here. Mr. Bergeron's here. You don't have to say yes, unless you want to. Ms. Meads is not going to say yes yet. She'll be here soon. Mr. Olipich? Here. Thanks. Vice Chair Wagner? Here. Mr. Butler? I'm here. I think I'm here. Colonel Roman, you on the phone? Yes, I'm on the phone, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Martinez? I'm here, Mr. Chair. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Mr. Stanley will not be able to attend the meeting today. Board members, I'll ask them to make sure your microphone is on and please speak into the mic so the public can hear you. If you turn your head while you're speaking, uh, take your mic with you. Um, a few reminders for those who are joining us uh, by Zoom, because we are on Zoom, members of the public who wish to address the board may use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. If members of the public are having any trouble and need help, please go to our website, sfwmd.gov, and click the Ask Us button at the top of the page. If you're using a phone and you'd like to comment, please press star 9 to raise your hand and star 6 to mute and unmute. And as a courtesy to others who wish to speak, members of the public are asked to comment only once on each item. We'll take a public comment first from those who are here in person and submitted a comment card, and then we'll follow that up uh, with those who've raised their hands on Zoom. Now we'll go to employee recognitions and our executive director, Drew Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, is this, on? this is on. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, we have October and November uh, recognitions to, to do this month, uh, since we were out away last month. So first we'll start with October. And our October 2021 Employee of the Month is Armando Ramirez. He is our Tribal and Federal Affairs Liaison. Now, I know you know Armando. He's been with the district for 10 years. He's been our, our Tribal Liaison for those 10 years. And because of him, the district is better. Uh, with our relationships with the tribes, we are good neighbors with the tribes. And in my time here, Armando has been just a fabulous advisor, uh, guiding me on how to do the proper interactions, what the issues are, how to resolve those issues. Um, and quite frankly, the tribal members have told me that they, they view him like a brother almost. I mean, he is, he is very much appreciated by the tribes, which helps us and our jobs so much better. I know that you have had his guidance as well as I have. Uh, the reason we are recognizing him in October is because of the work he's done on the uh, Sam Jones Abiyaki Prairie Wetland Restoration Project. In that project, there are cultural resources associated with the Seminole Tribe that are very important to them. And so doing a construction project in, a, in light of those, you can run into issues and, and some serious issues. And Armando has been there. Uh, talked with all the tribal members that are interested in talking about them day, night. He's always available. And because of his efforts, quite frankly, we're getting through those, uh, that project. Um, and it's really well-deserved recognition, although we could recognize him all the time. Uh, this particular effort was an incredibly valuable to us. So the October Employee of the Month is Armando Ramirez. Thank you.
Okay, our October 2021 Team of the Month is the G38 Arch Creek Gate Blockage Team. And that goes to Kurt Birchenoff, Joe Buzzard, Alberto Cantello, Ariel Alvarez Cruz, Robin Deaton, Juan Gonzalez, Alberto Lopez, Elinette Medina, Cherick Van Veen, and Andrew Wolf. G58 gate blockage. That sounds pretty rough and scary, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Here we are with, uh, with a uh, flood control responsibilities. We use gates to do those flood control responsibilities and it's blocked and that's a problem. And Ellen at Medina really uh, launched this team, but it, it included infrastructure management, right away, stream gauging, and the Miami field station. And here we are with a gate that has sediment and rocks, preventing it from full operation. And it's raining and there's tropical storms out there. And we're like, we gotta do something about this. So of course this team sprung into action and it, it involved surveying, it involved you know, all kinds of hard work and it even involved uh, underwater remote operated vehicle, uh, remote control submarine, I think that is what I would think of it as, and divers who went down and removed rocks and sediment themselves, but they got this job done. Uh, we were able to provide flood control for this area, and now we have a fully functional gate. And so team, come on up here and let's take a picture. Thank you. All right, so our November Employee of the Month goes to Chris Carlson. She's our lead geospatial data steward in the Information Technology Division. And uh, as you know, resiliency is a big deal for the South Florida Water Management District. And Chris has really stepped up and helped us improve our resiliency program from a computing data and analysis perspective. <clears throat> she has been critical and central and really helping us put together our metrics and our ways of looking at our vulnerability, our risks when it comes to flood protection and flood control. Um, and so she is like taking us from uh, just doing analysis to doing severe analysis. I mean, really great analysis. And when it comes to her talents, the really the flood damage cost tool is something that she's developed and that is looking at risk to flooding based on sea level rise and climate change. And you may remember last year we submitted an application for BRIC funding and we were deemed ineligible. Uh, and she, it was because we didn't have this tool together. Now she worked hard, she created incredible data sets. What's the elevation of roads? What's the foundation of buildings? So that we can put together a complete analysis of flood risk and, and costs associated with those flood risks. <clears throat> and <clears throat> we're reapplying for those grants on Friday uh, and it will include this work and we'll be in a much better position because of her efforts. Uh, we all experienced king tides uh, this last weekend. We saw what that looks like and she is the one putting together our good detailed analysis on how that affects district works. Um, and so that of course is a great uh, tool for us in communication of the, of the needs of the district and what we need going forward. So it's without hesitation, uh, oh, by the way, you all had a lunch and learn in November 
Um, uh, Dr. Moran and, and Akeen got a lot of credit for that incredible lunch and learn. Chris actually is a, very much a backbone to all the information presented in that, and so uh, she also deserves a lot of kudos. And that is why, with all that work, she is Employee of the Month for November. Thank you, Chris. Congratulations. <laughs> Ah, okay. We'll get a picture with her next time. All right. Let's talk about the November team of the month. And this goes to the pump station G370 and G372 emergency engine repairs team. Emergency engine repairs. That's uh, something. Joel Arietta, Adam Bouzenet, uh, yep, Sherrick Butts, John Garrett, D'Angelo Houston, Bobby Jackson, James Krupika, Nicholas Lager, Michael Morgan, Anna Palacios, Recording in progress. Tobon, Tara Story, Carlos Velasco, and Thomas White. Emergency engine repairs in the wet season, tropical storm, that sounds harrowing. And it was. <laughs> These two pump stations are massive many thousand CFS pump stations that are absolutely integral to flood control and flood protection. And during a routine inspection at the beginning of the wet season, they found metal shavings in the engine. And if you know anything about engines, metal shavings is not a good thing in these engines. And as they inspected all the other engines in both of these pump stations, they also had those metal shavings. And so it was, we, we created two crews one at one pump station, one at the other, and it's one engine down at a time because we needed the other three running for the wet season. And so there they are uh, working on these engines in the middle of summer inside a pump station that does not have air conditioning with engines running, noisy, hard business, six days a week for 10 hours each day for five months straight. Now all these engines are back in business. These are those, those incredible engines you've seen. Uh, they are antiques, some would say, but they're Fairbanks Morse engines. Uh, there's a lot of fans of those engines because of their durability, but it takes the maintenance and the expertise that these folks bring to repair those engines, to break them down and put them back together. And as far as I could tell, they don't use charts, you know, for these engines on how to do that. So it's a really impressive operation. They worked really hard. Now we have fully functional uh, uh, pumping stations, and it's thanks to their efforts obviously earned November Team of the Month. Congratulations. All right, now we have a 30-year service award, and this one is thanking Tony Jackson. She's a senior business management analyst in our Fort Lauderdale field station for her 30 years of service. Now, Tony came to the district in 1991, and she came in as a clerk and a radio operator. Yes, we used to have radio operators. Um, and, and she has jumped in with both feet. Uh, she's been at the Fort Lauderdale f uh, field station her whole career. Thank goodness she's a cornerstone for that field station. Uh, she has, she's dedicated herself to her improvement, her education. She got an accounting and economics degree from UF and FIU. And then she's invested a lot of time and training in becoming an HR specialist. And now she serves as one of our cornerstones and leaders in the HR program, particularly when it comes to field stations. 
So she has obviously gotten many promotions over her careers because now she really uh, sits in a, a leadership role when it comes to uh, operating the field stations with human resources in mind. And she has taken us, you know, she's been a subject matter expert on many of our endeavors, a lot of them on taking us from paper to electronic. She was there when every two weeks you would drive up the time sheets to headquarters and, and process payroll. Uh, we don't do that anymore. Uh, we use uh, uh, computers now. <laughs> but she was there for SAP, the HR payroll system, and she served us really well on the, in our emergency operations center and getting the web EOC stood up. Uh, so she has been uh, through it. Everybody knows that they can rely on her every day, and it's not just the Fort Lauderdale field station, it's other field station, it's us here at headquarters. And so we're so thankful that she's been here and stuck with us for 30 years and, and really appreciate her service. Tony Jackson, 30 years of service. Well, thank you very much, Drew, for doing that, and uh, sure. congratulations to Armando and uh, Christine and Tony and to our team. Mr. Chair, oh, yes, uh, we had an accounting uh, issue, but we do have a 40-year recognition uh, that uh, Rich. I, I need to rely on Rich because he knows the person; been here for 40 years. So, if he could introduce him and we get a picture, that would be great. I, I would love to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Drew. Yes, we don't want to miss Joe Granier or Lambert Granier. Joe has been with us a long time. He started, I believe, in our pump station division. He was the chief out at uh, pump station S7 for many years. I actually worked with him out there as a project manager on the refurbishment of the station um, where we did overhaul the uh, pumps and engines and things. He eventually moved his way into the field station as an expert in SAP and as one of our planner schedulers. He has worked his way up through and provided an incredible amount of uh, 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 support to the field station and the rest of the district. Right now he supports through SAP and the field station planning position the engine overhaul and pump overhaul program for the entire district. He manages all the work orders and, and planning for that program and he's just done an incredible job. He's a great friend. He's, he's just a good guy. I, I want to thank him. Joe Granier. <laughs>
Again, thanks, Drew, and thanks, Joe, for 40 years. That's, that's wonderful. We'll move on now to item number four, which is uh, agenda revisions. And uh, Rosie, are there any changes to the agenda today? No, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Is Ms. Meads close? Do you know? I, mean, you, I know you're not tracking her, but. It doesn't matter, but we're going to do the um, agenda item abstentions by board members now. And Mr. Bergeron, I'll start with you. Do you have any abstentions? No. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Olipich? No, I don't. Um, I do. I'm going to abstain from item number 20. It's the 10-year update of the CRU uh, general management plan. Um, I'm an uncompensated uh, board member of the or trustee of the uh, CRU land and water trust. I'll be abstaining from 20. Um, Vice Chair Wagner, do you have any? None. Thank you. Mr. Butler? No, sir. Colonel Roman? None. And Mr. Martinez? <clears throat> we'll come back to Mr. Martinez and Mr. Meads just to make sure. And now we're going to go to the uh, Big Cypress Basin Board Report with uh, Colonel Roman, who's the chair of the Big Cypress Basin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. The Big Cypress Basin Board met on October 28th, 2021. <coughs> We began our meeting with Brad Jackson, who gave an update on Audubon's Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary and the collaborative efforts to address hydrology changes caused by ongoing agriculture and residential development in the watershed. In 2019, the Basin Board approved cost share funding for a modeling project to further examine contributing factors to these hydrologic changes the findings of which were presented to the board this February. At that time, the board requested that the Basin, District, and Audubon work together to determine the next steps to address the issues of Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary and to protect the Basin's water resources while maintaining flood level of service. Since that time, quarterly coordination meetings have been instituted and the two agencies are working closely together to improve regional topographic data through increased surface water monitoring. Also, a new regional modeling tool is currently under development and scheduled for completion around December 2023. Excuse me. Next, we had a presentation on the Picayune Watershed Water Quality Siting Analysis from Sean Meyer. This project funded by the basin is the follow on to feasibility study completed by the district last year. Over the next eight months, a technical working group will be examining parcels near the Picayune Strand Restoration Project to find suitable land that is available to address flows entering the downstream outstanding Florida waters. The goal is to have the water quality component completed when the Picayune Strand Restoration SERP project starts full operation. Dwayne Piper made a presentation on the new Big Cypress Basin Communication Tower project and will extend the South Florida Water Management District microwave backbone into the Big Cypress Basin. The new Western Spur will complete the district system, increasing reliability and providing additional capacity for future monitoring sites. The tower is scheduled to be completed in fiscal year 2024. Next, Candy Heater brought forth the Basin's fiscal year 2022-2023 preliminary budget for discussion. Note, the draft fiscal year 2022-2023 preliminary budget is $14,665,727. A decrease of two million seven seventy six five hundred dollars from the 2021 2022 adopted budget. We closed out the meeting with staff reports from Lisa Keeler and Candy Heater, in which the 2022 BCB meeting dates were discussed, as well as the basin's outreach efforts and the new subsequent reporting within the budget. The next basin board meeting is February 24th. 2022 at 1.30. And that concludes my report, subject to your questions. Oh, thank you very much, Chair Roman. Does anyone have any questions or comments about the Big Cypress Basin? I'm hearing none. Thanks very much. And 
we'll move on to the next item, which is the approval. Thank you. Thank you. The approval of the minutes for the October 14th meeting and the October 20th uh, lunch and learn workshops. Are there any board members that changes to the minutes for the October 14th meeting or the October 20th lunch and learn workshop? Can I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes for the meetings? I'll make a motion, please. I'll second. second. I have a motion and a couple of seconds. You figure out the seconds. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any further discussion by the board? I'm hearing none. Let's go ahead and call that question. Uh, Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mr. Olipich? Yes. I'll vote yes. Vice Chair Wagner? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Colonel Roman? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Meets not here. Uh, that passes unanimously. And Mr. Martinez, while I have you on the phone, do you, do you have any abstentions? No, none, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. I will now move to the executive director's report, Mr. Burlett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, got a couple of programs to update you on. Uh, first of all, the Northern Everglades and Estuaries Protection Program. Um, as you know, you get a, a one pager in your packet every month, so you can look and see the uh, efforts of, of FDACs and DEP uh, on BMP implementation and, and those uh, B maps. Uh, from the district's perspective, we are request for proposals for all those project ideas that we need across the state. Uh, will it was noticed? It will get published this week, um, and so we will look to see. Uh, what kind of I project ideas folks have out there and, and be able to evaluate those and, and do what's best for water quality in the northern uh, watersheds. Uh, speaking of good projects, the Scott Water Farm is now online. Uh, fortunately, just in time, because we had all those rains over the weekend in St. Lucie County, and they were able to use that water farm to trap their rain and do some pumping uh, to help protect the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, so another, another project online, we're going to have a celebration because those rains it kind of rained out an event we were planning, uh, but we want to do an event up there uh, for that new project. It's a significant landscape project for us in the Northern Everglades program. Um, SERP, got a lot to update you on with a Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Um, of course, we are aggressively implementing SERP uh, because, you know, it's going to make a difference. The EAA Reservoir Project, the uh, STA site is on full-blown construction. There's tractors everywhere. Uh, it's, it's really coming along um, on schedule. It's, it's a, uh, uh, I'm excited to see that, that moving and, and really dirt getting moved around out there. Uh, on the EA Reservoir front, uh, I told you last year the first award was announced from the Corps for the inflow outflow canal. As happens in procurement world, there was a bid protest by three companies on that award. Um, uh, I guess they think they deserved it. So uh, what happens in the federal process is it goes to the general accounting office to review the bid protest, uh, and they have a due date of February 2nd to resolve that or make a decision on that bid protest. Uh, so uh, we will make sure that the general accounting office knows how important this project is to us and the, you know, uh, 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 being a um, timeliness is, is key here, you know, to, to make, make sure this project goes along, and I'll keep you posted uh, on that bid protest. Um, in the area of Sending Water South, uh, SEP North, that is uh, the northern part of the Central Everglades project, which basically restores the northern part of 3A, uh, gets more river of grass flowing instead of canal th going through river of grass. Uh, and degrading some berms so we have good sheet flow coming out uh, into Water Conservation Area 3A. We are in design on SEP North. Uh, I did send a letter to uh, uh, Mr. Pinkham at the Corps of Engineers uh, asking to sign a project partnership agreement. That's what we needed for the EA Reservoir. <clears throat> it's what we need to get projects underway, under construction. Um, the hold up on a PPA is a validation report. So some sort of projects when they get authorized require a validation report. That has yet to be completed, so I asked for the expeditious completion of that so we could sign the PPA. We're ready to start construction in April. So that's the, what I told them, uh, and we will continue to monitor that and get this PPA signed so we can start constructing SEP North. Moving over to the East Coast, uh, the other 
uh, critical project is the Indian River Lagoon South project uh, that was authorized in 2007. Um, we got a great agenda item later uh, today on that, but another component of IRL South is what's called natural lands, uh, and that is the acquisition of lands, restoring their hydrology and keeping them in conservation. Allopata Flats is an example of a natural lands project that we celebrated last year. Um, and so uh, we partnered with Martin County to pursue a Florida Forever program application. That is a conservation land buying program uh, that's run by DEP, but ultimately land acquisition is approved by the cabinet. So Barbie Ranch is a 2,000 acre ranch, beautiful land, I've been there. Um, it could use some hydrologic restoration, but it's right north of our C44 stormwater treatment area and right east of Allapata Flats. So it's a good contiguous area, um, but it is a Florida Forever program. I've informed uh, the Secretary of DEP how um, important this is, uh, but I appreciate Martin County for you know engaging us and, and partnering with us. Since it's a CERT project, of course, we will uh, do the hydrologic restoration. We will uh, manage the land if, if it is acquired through the Florida Forever project. So it's a, it's a great opportunity that we're pursuing that I wanted to let you know. <clears throat> um, Loxahatchee uh, River, an estuary restoration that was authorized in 2020. Um, I have asked for a project partnership agreement for the Corps of Engineers in a letter I sent in October. Um, we are, uh, that's on the IDS. We've already done a lot of land acquisition, so getting it under a performance partnership agreement is important because we get credit on the cost share ledger, which is also important. Uh, so I don't see any issues. There's no validation report on this one. So uh, Colonel Booth is, is working with our team to put these agreements together for Loxahatchee. Uh, the last thing on SERP is the last year the state passed the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Protection a statute associated with the implementation of that. It set aside 50, at least $50 million a year for implementation of LACO watershed. Uh, it asked us to pursue a partnership agreement, which we've done and signed uh, for a credit agreement, and then uh, to really push for the authorization in 2022, which we've done, and the Corps has assured us that they're preparing it for that authorization. But the other thing it did is it asked us to send an update to the legislature and the governor on November 1st which we submitted to them. You've got a copy uh, with you. And that includes all the efforts that are ongoing. Uh, we are in, in, engaged in land acquisition for the wetland restoration uh, part of the Lake Okeechobee watershed plan. And obviously we're implementing the science plan and the test wells associated with the aquifer storage and recovery uh, well clusters. And uh, most recently we've set up uh, a proof of concept demonstration project for treatment technologies that can treat the water to drinking water quality before it's injected, which is a permit requirement. Um, so we've got it set up on the shores of uh, the Kissimmee River, uh, and there's four treatment technologies, basically different filtration, disinfectant trains up there. Uh, we are looking at scheduling an open house for those. Uh, our field stations are helping mon uh, operate those so that we get familiar with them because we will have to op operate them in perpetuity. Um, so we've got four out there uh, set up, uh, getting tested, and we'll have an open house sometime in December so everyone who wants to can come out and see the effort uh, along there. So a uh, lot going on in SERP, uh, that, so it's hard to drone on so long about that, but it's a lot of effort, um, and it's aggressive. That's what we're expected to do. Um, Losum, uh, that's... I'm going to let Colonel Booth uh, talk to you about Losum and the next agenda item uh, because it's really in their court right now. Um, but the one thing I wanted to reflect upon, you know, it, it's going to be great to move into a new regulation schedule away from LORS into a new regulation schedule to help us with our water management. Um, you know, as we do that, I was thinking about the past three years uh, that this board has been here, that we've worked with the Corps on operations, and we've gotten probably lucky at times, but uh, you know, we haven't had those harmful summertime discharges to the estuaries in those three years. Um, so, and we haven't hit a water shortage cutbacks or anything. So I thank mother nature <laughs> for that. Uh, but you know, it's, we're on a good run and I just jinxed us, I'm sure. So <laughs> anyway, that's my, uh, that's my report, Mr. Chair. Thanks very much. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Mr. Bartlett? Mr. Olipich. Uh, 
Mr. Bartlett, I just wanted to thank you uh, on behalf of Martin County and uh, for the Barbie Lance Ranch possibility. And I know uh, Commissioner Hurd is here from Martin County as well as uh, Franny Hutchinson from St. Lucie County. And we're really all connected, whether the, the river doesn't know a line between us. And um, I, I must say, because I know I'm hard on you sometimes, <laughs> that these are really the times where your gifts shine. You have such good ability um, because of all of the places you've been before you came here, FDEP, Department of the Interior, your ability with people and programs, and we benefit from that. And I thank you very much for, um, you just know, you know how to walk in many theaters. You're not limited just to the South Florida Water Management District, and it really helps us. Thank you. Thank you. Say one thing about Drew. And Drew manages stress really well, <laughs> right? It's like, um, it's like what? It, what is it that Top Gun pilots say when they're coming into land? They say, "I'm coming in hot," which I think it means they have a MIG on their tail. It's like Drew does this all the time, really stressful conflict stuff, and it, it looks like it doesn't bother him. It, and I know it does, but we're thankful, Drew. It's thank all those you. folks behind me. We need we need to talk about not talking to a pitcher in the middle of a no hitter. <laughs> you gotta you gotta get on. That. All right, we'll buy Drew some more stress balls and move on. Uh, so we're now we're going to go to a uh, the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual report. Uh, we're lucky to have. Um, Colonel Booth here, who is the district commander of the Corps of Engineers at Jacksonville District, as well as Ava Velez. Um, so, Colonel Booth, thanks very much for being here, and we look forward to your lesson update. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Governing Board, th thank you for having us here today. Uh, very happy to, to be here and discuss the Lake Okeechobee, uh, or the Lowsome process. And before I get into Lowsome, I just want to acknowledge the amazing partnership that we continue to maintain uh, with the district. I tell you what, it's, 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 it's an important, it, it needs to be recognized how well our organizations work together and it's, it's a good example of how a federal and non-federal uh, relationship should work. And so thank you very much for having us here today to give this update. Uh, two months ago when I assumed command of the Jacksonville District, uh, I think many of you, many of the team members said, hey listen, I don't think you understand how significant the amount of public or stakeholder involvement uh, comes with the Lowsome process. And uh, I, I was there watching it. I don't think I fully understood that. I think the team probably undersold it a little bit. Uh, but, but, but what a great challenge to have uh, and a great place for us to be, to be able to talk about where we are after two years of effort. And, and I'm very honored to be here to do that. Uh, I won't lie and say that the conversations have all been easy or simple. But what we can thank is that all the different stakeholders, all the members of the public that have, have come to our meetings, given us feedback, e even if it's from a point of passion that may be sometimes hard to hear, the one thing that it's done has made us better as an organization is, is to listening and understanding uh, the functions of the system, the different interests that, that different organizations and people come from, and that's helped us come to a better plan, uh, continuing to evolve the versions of the plan that we see uh, that we'll talk about today, and Ms. Velez will talk about it in a little more detail after these comments. <clears throat> uh, one of the comments that we do hear, uh, well, well, let me just say that that plan as it evolves has certainly gotten better and better, and, and I do believe and can honestly say that LOSUM is going to be better than LORS. It's going to be a vast improvement under how we're operating today, and, and uh, to the executive director, um, uh, yes, weather. Uh, could, could come on us, but, but it also operate, it, it drives how we operate, uh, shows how the lake, or, well, drives how the lake runs, and also the system. So that's very important. Uh, one of the feedback we did get is, is concerns with, with speed. And we can understand that, that the, the speed with which we've moved through maybe the last six months with all the modeling can be a little uh, disconcerting for some or different organizations. Uh, and we appreciate that. Uh, but I think we need to make sure that everybody understands that it's, it's not the case that we're not listening and taking all that feedback into account as we move through this process. Uh, what allows us to move at the pace that we have over the last, uh, last portion of the process is, is all the effort that the, the team has put in over the previous two years to set conditions for that modeling. 
uh, and be that figuring out uh, all the different, uh, running a bunch of different model runs, or if it's developing performance metrics to, with which to assess those runs, uh, going through different single iteration or issue model runs, and then comparing and looking at how those interact uh, allows us to move through the process and ultimately get to the develop plan that we went into about three months ago, which we have been optimizing and, and brings us to, to where we are today and a point where we can identify or over this next week and early next week, uh, identify the preferred alternative, uh, which will give us the kind of the best bang for our buck and the, for the greatest number of issues, project purposes, or stakeholders, depending on how you want to frame or look at the different uh, concerns that we're dealing with. And, and I've said it before, and, and, and I will say it again, uh, we're not there completely, and LOSM will not get us there where we want to be to operate the system for the long term. Uh, we have got to continue to develop the capability to convey, store, and treat uh, water moving throughout the central and southern Florida system. And we're not going to be able to get everything we want until we get all the rest of the infrastructure uh, and, and, and the SERP program d delivered. And, but I don't want to underestimate or undersell the importance of how well uh, we, we believe that LOSAN will provide for the system in the short term while we continue to develop and, and deliver those projects. Uh, LOSAN will be letter, better than LORS. Uh, this, the schedule will be a major improvement over the status quo and pretty much, pretty much uh, across the board. And I'm not talking about minor improvements. Uh, LOSAN will be significantly better than LORS and, and delaying the execution uh, of this operating system, anything beyond, you know, with even more than a few months of when we get the Herbert Hoover Dyke delivered and completed uh, in December of 2022 will be disservice to us all. Uh, and, and so I, what I will say is I kind of close these opening comments is we've been hearing a lot. Uh, what I will do uh, in the next couple of minutes is go through a, a summary of the feedback that we've been getting. I'll, I'll talk about the iteration goals real quick and then talk about a, a summary of the feedback that we've been receiving uh, since we talked to, or rolled out some, some uh, draft model runs uh, on the 26th of October. So just, just a reminder, once we went into optimization, the, the, the goals that we were looking for here were to recognize the Seminole Tribe of Florida as a separate and distinct water user, uh, reduce the stress to the Caloosahatchee River and estuary, help lake ecology by addressing the duration and number of events over 17 feet, and stay as, as good or better than alternative CC and water supply, and then flexibility in the lower portions of the schedule, send more water south and address algae. Now, what I'll say is this, this may feel a little odd, me giving you the feedback before we talk about the recent process. We went with this option just so that you could maybe key in on when, when Ms. Velez is going through some of the specific details, key in on the feedback that you heard or that we've heard as you're listening to the more detailed portion of the briefing. And, and if you need us to come back around to what folks said after uh, we go through that portion of the briefing, I can understand it. We could have presented it in, in two different ways. Uh, but I'll just jump into the feedback as we heard based on different portions of the system. If you look at Lake Okeechobee performance, uh, the feedback came in that high lake stages over 17 feet are, are particularly damaging to the lake, though anything over, I'm sorry? Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, thank you very much. I apologize. Uh, so the stages over 17 feet are particularly damaging because of how long it takes to actually recover uh, from the lake stages going over that level. However, we do understand in here that, that you do see stress and damage above 15 feet. Along those same lines, uh, we see that anything when we're in those stressful or damaging flows have, a, have the potential to affect the quality and quantity of marshes in the lake, uh, snail kite impacts as well as wading bird impacts, and then impacts to the fisheries. Uh, it'll go down a couple of bullets here, but if you take that fisheries impact specifically into potentially the bass fishery, uh, the impacts that that could have on uh, recreation and then tourism are, are of concern that we heard about. Uh, we also heard that the eight proposed plans, or excuse me, the eight model runs that we talked about on the 26th, and I'll, and I'll clarify, and Ms. Flores will talk in here in a minute. When we rolled out those eight plans, they were eight model runs that had the characteristics or good characteristics that we wanted to see in LOSM and, and get folks feedback. Uh, those particular model runs uh, did not represent, the feedback we got was those represent, did not represent a balance uh, for Lake Okeechobee as compared to the benefits that received in other portions of the system. And then uh, also that the, the, the feedback also came in that the number of times the lake goes over 17 feet 
should be considered as well as or more so than the percentage of time that the lake is sitting over 17 feet. And, uh, and then finally, the other, uh, the other bit of feedback we got was that there was mixed support for lake recovery modes uh, in the water control plan. So there was a lot of support for recovery of, of the lake and the benefits to lake ecology, uh, but also concerns expressed about what that recovery mode would do uh, for releases uh, to the northern estuaries uh, when you're running that recovery mode. When moving to the Caloosahatchee, we heard uh, concerns, pardon me, let me flip my notes. Uh, going back to those eight model runs, uh, there was a perspective that it, those eight model runs did improve a, a balanced performance for the northern estuaries and the Lake Worth Lagoon. Uh, but there was continued emphasis that releases greater than 6,500 cubic feet per second uh, do represent or remain a concern uh, for the Caloosahatchee and, and minimizing those discharges it would be preferred in any of the alternatives we go we would look towards and that gets to the next comment about uh, fewer runs between 6500 are always preferred and also looking at uh, the lowest percentage of time in zones a b and c and you'll see those in a graphic in a little while in the presentation uh, also looking at a reoccurring feedback that total flows off of the lake are, are what drive damaging or stressful and damaging events uh, to the caloosahatchee and then there was also some feedback about allowing operational flexibility in the modeling zones D2 and D3 that would allow potentially to send up to 1,400 cubic feet per second uh, to the Caloosahatchee throughout the operational zone. And you'll see that in that, that uh, graphic as well. From the Saint, uh, on the side of the St. Lucie estuary performance, uh, lake releases uh, out of S308 or from the lake are, are too high in all of the eight model runs presented. And, and none represent an acceptable solution uh, from the feedback that we received. Uh, the runs, their uh, feedback also indicated that there were runs that were available that kept the flows out of the lake uh, ab below a level that would produce 100,000 acre feet a year. And anything below that would be more preferred though. Uh, we, we've heard that anything obviously in that direction is, is a concern. Uh, reducing flows out of uh, 308 uh, this, this topic talks about is, is the highest priority and there were some concerns and there's a lot of words in this second to last bullet, but it talks more along the lines of it. overall, if you're pushing water out of the lake, we don't like it. And there were not, uh, feedback was that they're not necessarily preferred, the, the recovery lake trigger, triggered stress. It's just a different way that we, we measured or assessed those models. And the feedback was, hey, just look at how much flows are coming off the lake. That's the main concern area. And then finally, that the, the, we should have screened out runs that showed releases in zone D. That's what we call the operational zone, the zone that we expect to operate the lake in for the most period of time. And, and it, what that comment goes to is out of the eight, there was one that we presented that didn't really actually match up with the, the preferred characteristics that we said we were looking for. Uh, no concerns or no argument there. Probably should have only showed seven. Uh, so next uh, slide. Can I yes, ask just a quick question? It seems silly, but I just have to. Um, when you say, can you go back to the last slide? When you say too high, lake releases are too high, do you mean too much volume, too many times? What does the word high mean when you say it's too high? And I'm sorry, ma'am, which bullet are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about, about uh, St. Lucie's performance, lake releases through S308 are too high. You mean it happens too frequently? Do you mean the volume is too much? What's the word high mean? I, I think the simple answer is it, it, from the perspective that we were receiving was yes. Uh, so in any releases, the perspective is any releases coming out of the lake are, are, are too much in, in that direction uh, for the stakeholders or for the estuary's benefit. Uh, May generally. I please make a comment? I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I believe. It's acre feet. Got it. Acre feet is the word you're looking for. Okay. Okay, and, and this will be the last slide of, of feedback. And this is this one talks generally to the flows south or to the South Florida ecology. We just received a lot of questions on, on the benefits of using a conservation mode. And if you look in some of these diagrams, we'll, we'll talk about those zones D2 and D3. And then we also received questions about sending more water south and what's, what's creating the limitations uh, for sending flows south. Uh, for water supply, 
Uh, the northern Palm Beach area uh, water supply isn't modeled, or that we received feedback that the model didn't take it into account uh, appropriately. Uh, we received feedback that none of the eight plans presented, uh, or none of the eight plans that we presented restore uh, minimum flows or levels or water supply to pre lors 08 uh, performance conditions. Uh, conservation modes uh, that are, need, are needed at the lower lake stages to reduce the risk of low water availability uh, to natural and uh, developed areas. And then uh, needs for assurances that low some flexibility will not cause adverse impacts uh, beyond what's covered in, in the NEPA scoping documents. And then finally, uh, the overall, a couple of the overall feedbacks as I've addressed earlier, concerns about uh, needing more time to review the optimization data and submit runs for consideration, uh, though we were receiving runs for consideration up till last Friday. And, and we do appreciate the information that we received from many stakeholders. And then allow for uh, minim maximum releases out of all outlets in zone A. That's to include uh, the C51 canal. And that just gets to, if you're to the point on the lake uh, when you're most concerned about the threat of, of, of overtopping or flooding or damaging the, the dike, uh, then we should maximize our capability to flow water out of, out of the lake in any direction that we, that we can. And uh, with that, I'll be happy to take questions, and likely some of your questions may be answered in, in the more detailed information that Ms. Velez has, but happy to open that up now. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions for Colonel Booth right now? Great hearing none. We'll go on with Ms. Velez. Thanks, right, Colonel. Thank you. Sound check. Okay, good. Good morning. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, Governing Board members, Mr. Bartlett, uh, thank you for inviting us to be here today. I wanted to uh, start with um, some reflection on how far we've come. We started this process in January of 2019, and we have come such a long way together as a community, as stakeholders, as partners, and I just don't want us to miss that chance to really reflect upon everything that we've accomplished. I wanted to take a moment to thank Mr. Bartlett, Ms. Reynolds, Mr. Mitnick, who's not here, Mr. Glenn, um, because our team has been better because of your support, your technical expertise, and your engagement with the core through this process. And it's just important for us to acknowledge that in this moment in time before we make our announcement uh, next week. Um, because we know, and I wanna echo what Colonel Booth is saying, that LOSIM will be um, a better place for all of us. Our communities will be safer and our environment will be considered in a more holistic way because we have a stronger dike and we have more infrastructure. And so I just wanted us to take stock and reflect upon how far we've come uh, as we head into the big decision the commander has to make next week. So where we are today is on step number six and seven in our schedule. And what that means is that we are identifying a model run that is the bones of our philosophy, of our schedule, but it is not everything because models are estimates of what all of us can do in the real world and they're surrogates for thinking and using science to make good decisions. And so number seven is the development of the operational guidance. Um, Several of you join us in, in our public engagements and I thank you for that. So we've been working on the words that come with the lines on a plot and the model numbers. Um, and so those are the two steps that we're on. What we will release next Tuesday is the model run that is the bones of our philosophy. And then when we talked to the, uh, the team as well as the public in December, we will have words that come with those and so that's where we are number six and seven and then um, shortly thereafter our team will release the report that brings everything together in the springtime that's step number eight and then we'll spend all next year talking about that documentation so our story of optimization 
has been very technical, and I will do my best to walk you through this in a, in a story versus a bunch of just numbers. We decided to take all of the seven goals that our commander gave us, and we translated those to modeling strategy. And what we wanted to do was evaluate um, as much of a set of solutions as we could, knowing that sometimes when you turn one knob, it's not enough. You need to turn a few knobs in order to get uh, where you'd like to go. But we wanted to show everyone every step of the way. And so the way we did that in modeling was that we would show one increment of change. And one example was the, the model run that we had identified alternative CC. Um, one easy example is at the lower part of the schedule, there was the zone that uh, preserved more water in the lake and didn't send water west and south in that portion. We all know it as zone F, right? So one of the things we did was, well, let's allow, let's preserve the opportunity to send water west and south first and just see what happens. So everyone could see together and learn what the outcomes of each of those incremental changes were. Um, and then we showed everybody how putting all those things together uh, would look. And so that's basically what, what I'm telling you here in, in, in uh, these arrows is that we, we did a series of model runs that were incremental, you know, they're one change at a time, and then those became certain outcomes. Um, we knew those wouldn't be enough, right? And so then we brought them together and we call those batch runs. And we did 240,000 of those because our inner agency modeling center are a bunch of rock stars and they're amazing and they always make us look good. And so I'd like to just take a moment and thank uh, from your staff, Mr. Walter Wilcox, um, who makes all of us smarter every single day uh, in addition to the core team. And so that's what we did. We, we came out in October and we showed everybody, here's all the data we're looking at. Everybody look at it with us. Um, and then we showed everybody what we were thinking of the data. So that's what happened in late October. And so that's what we've been doing um, in the last couple of weeks is listening to, um, as the commander said, what everybody was thinking, as well as taking individual model runs that someone else might have found. Um, what we are gonna show you next week is everybody's model runs in, in addition to the ones we identified and kind of how we evaluated those. That's what's coming next. So I'm gonna, I just went over all of this, so I'm gonna skip it. So here is a range of model outcomes and, and let me talk you through this. Um, so on the left side, you've got um, a scenario, right? So ECB means existing conditions baseline and A25 means no action. That means if you have lures in place in the year of 2025, um, we, ex we expect the C44 reservoir to be online, the C43 reservoir to be online, Kissimmee River is finished, right? All those things are in model world, but it's lures, right? We don't have LOSIM yet. So those would be the model outcomes related to that. Alternative CC is that third one. And then there's eight model runs um, that were included in this latest set of, of of batch runs that had a series of changes to CC. And so on the top there from left to right, we can see Lake Okeechobee performance, then flow south, Clusachi Estuary, St. Lucie Estuary, Lake Worth Lagoon, and water supply. These are by far not everything we look at. These are a snapshot of the dozens and dozens and dozens of performance metrics that our team evaluates with all the scientists and engineers and stakeholders in our team. And so a couple of things um, to look at. So if we um, think about our iteration three goals, right, if you remember at the top of the list was uh, the Seminole Tribe as a as a distinct water user. And the way that we looked at that was how do we make sure that we can protect their entitlement documented under the Water Rights Compact. Um, and so we did that uh, a couple ways, but if you look over on the right, you'll notice it says STOF. So that's Seminole Tribe of Florida, Big Cypress Reservation, or Brighton Reservation. Those are those last two columns. And so we were looking at um, percentages not met, so lower is better, right? You want the demand to be met, 
um, in terms of water supply for the Seminole Tribe, and so lower would be better. And uh, what we saw were really good outcomes uh, for that one, as well as uh, Losa, meaning Lake Okeechobee service area, right? So those are all the communities around Lake Okeechobee that depend on Lake Okeechobee for their water supply. One good example is the city of Okeechobee, right, that gets their water supply directly from Lake Okeechobee. Um, and so we were looking at one of our other goals, which was how do we maintain water supply performance from what we had in CC or better? And so again, lower is better. Um, and so if you look at CC, just one of the things we look at was the weighted average of cutbacks. So when we have droughts or, when we, or shortages um, within the system, we can assess what demands were not met. Um, and so you'll see pretty good, pretty good performance there in comparison to CC. And you'll note something that's uh, pretty interesting is that when you look at the characteristics of, of LOSA moving forward, you'll note that we're able to accomplish pretty good performance for water supply while not having a zone F, which was a, a very real concern that the stakeholders shared with us, right? What happens if you don't have a no release zone? Um, how do you make sure that we still think about water supply as well as the environment? And so we, we've got some pretty good numbers there. Um, and so if we think about uh, the second bullet of our iteration three goals, which was about the Caloosahatchee, we acknowledged that the stress of the Caloosahatchee was too much, was not well balanced in CC, and we needed to work on that. And so some of the ways that we addressed that was um, we said, well, we want to take a look at the total flow from the lake to the west, right? That's S77 regulatory flow, if you look at that column there. And you'll note that the, in, the, in the no action and lures, um, we wanted to make sure that we kept an eye on that. We didn't want the, the future plan to make that worse, right? And we had seen that, it, that, that CC was higher. See how CC is 578 versus 528? We didn't want to do that. Um, and so we took a look at that. Um, and so one of the ways that we were able to improve the performance, and, and especially if you look at the stress and damaging numbers, see how significantly better those are, is that in the very large operational zone, zone D for LOSM, we said, um, after listening and having lots of conversations with our West Coast stakeholders, we said we are going to um, try our best to not send any water from the lake that then makes the flows at S79 greater than 2,000 CFS. And so we gave that a try um, in order to meet that goal, and we saw really, really good numbers. So I'm going to point you to two red columns, which is an important trade-off that, that we are um, evaluating in LOSUM. See how it says CRE 6,500 and then SLE 4,000? See how those are red, primarily? Um, it's because the way that we're thinking about LOSUM is that we have a very large operational <coughs> zone where the lake would spend, let's say, 90% of the time, right, or 80% of the time. And that zone is about benefits. That's the thinking. Where we spend the majority amount of time is where we would spend, send no flows east because the St. Lucie does not need any of those flows. So that would be zero. And the flows to the west from Lake Okeechobee are beneficial, so less than 2,000 from the lake in concert with the C43 reservoir and assessing conditions in that zone. Water supply has a crucial part to play in that zone, sending water south has a crucial part to play in that zone, and the lake ecology itself has a crucial part. So what happens is that when we hold water in the lake because we have the benefit of the, of the dike, as long as we can to provide beneficial thinking, when we go to the higher parts, then we have to release. And so when we release, we, we release east and west and those higher, higher flows, as well as south. And that's what's happening. We're sharing that part when the lake has to release water in the higher zones. So that's why those look like that. Um, and so let's go to the St. Lucie estuary. 
over on the, a little in the yellow there. So the S-308 regulatory flows. The outcomes, those numbers are there only in the very, very high zones. Those numbers still retain zero flows to the St. Lucie for the majority of the schedule. And I'm gonna show you an, a, another graphic. I just kinda of wanted to talk you through what these mean and how you see how the lowest there was 117. So this is a range of performance. Then ending with Lake Okeechobee. So uh, we see increased percent of time above 17 in order to accomplish all the things that we just discussed. Uh, we are holding a little bit more water in Lake Okeechobee. I'm sorry, do you mind just for um, <clears throat> clarity purposes? Yes, so it's 117 acre feet. 117,000 acre feet per right. year. Yes, 117,000 acre feet per year. I think it would just help when you speak about that. And the, also, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, for the public, it's like what is KAF slash year? You know, this is your eighth grade classroom, and we're yes, we're, we're talk, the, the public needs to understand this on a very base level. If if you don't mind, thank you. You bet. Thank you for that reminder. And I will, I will work on that as well as we keep going. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just from me, this right here is yes. one of the most helpful tools that you guys have given me. So if you take it from me, this is in the back of the packet. And it, it really, because otherwise I go through here and try to yep. follow the numbers. And it's a I lot really to take can't. in. Yep. But, but what we see is that 168491 actually looks kind of like a winner. It's really very helpful. Thank you for that. So she's, just for everyone else that's uh, participating, this is the one that Ms. Meads is raising. Um, and so this is the same information presented in graphical format, not as many of the performance metrics. Uh, but as you, as you go around that uh, radar chart, right, you've got Lake Okeechobee environment at the top, navigation, recreation, the St. Lucie, uh, algal bloom risk to the northern estuaries as I'm going around the clock there, and South Florida flows yeah. to South Florida. So it looks right. to me like the red yep. line is the, uh, on the chart, that's the only one that makes conditions better for St. Lucie. Right? Isn't that what I'm seeing based on, because when you had the, the red and the, what's the other color? Um, anyway, mm -hmm. the, uh, wasn't that, now go back to the other one. You, if bet. you don't mind. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just trying to, it's just no, I like heavy. It. Okay, so if you go to 168491 uh, and follow it all the way over to um, SLE 4000 CFS, this right, right that's here. green. It's the only one that's green. So does, it, does that mean, mm -hmm. to a pea brain like me, does that mean that that's the run that is the only run that is helpful or most helpful to St. Lucie? Is that what that means? No, ma'am. Oh. No, ma'am. Um, <laughs> so, so what that actually means is that at the very, very top of the schedule, we are loading the extreme flows more to the Clusahatchee than the St. Lucie in that run. See how it has 85 yep. to the Clusahatchee yep, yep. and a little bit less than no action to the St. Lucie. That's what it's, that actually means. If we look at the middle, the lar by far the largest time of the schedule, the largest zones of the schedule, you'll note that um, that's where the, the other metrics for the St. Lucie come in, where the St. Lucie est uh, estuary stakeholders want us to focus and, and we do on this one very, very important metric, which is what is the average annual flow out of the lake to the east? The existing condition is approximately 231,000 acre feet per year. Got it. The lowers, the no action in 25 is 187,000 acre feet per year. Yeah. So and so everything there is below that. Okay, so when I work a maze puzzle, I start at the end and work backwards. I know that's cheating, but it's the only way I can do it, yep. and I'm driven to be a winner. So, so can we just very quickly look at the multi-objective performance comparison, because that tells yes. us graphically 
which is the best, right? Now, it, of the ones that you have given us where we are right now. Mm -hmm. So can you just get to the end and then back up because I'm just dying yes. to know which of those runs is the best run because I, I need you to tell me because I thought it was the red one. Okay. So the there yeah. closer to the center is better. The closer to the center, but there are too many spikes. I can't can't figure it out on my own. The closer to the center is better, right? Yeah. And so what we're showing you there is that let's pick St. Lucie to get to get to your first question, uh, Miss Meads. All of the runs that we are showing you mm -hmm. are better for the St. Lucie than Lores. Got it. That's that's where we're at. So if we if we look at the outside there, the gray is existing, the black is Lores with future work, and then as you go inwards, you'll see um, all of them have significant improvement in the the Lake Okeechobee flows to the St. Lucie. And what is CCTSP? I've forgotten. It. That was the alternative CC that we identified. Okay. Where right. We started. Yes. Correct. Yep. Well, Correct. not started, but you know what I mean. I do. I do. Okay. And so then just of those lines, the closer you get in, the better you are. So it looks like the contenders are red, green. Who, who, who wins, right? According, just tell me, which one is better? Because I get lost in the spikes. Just tell me. Somebody tell me. Which one? So we will release Where are the, we now? Right. So we are evaluating. We will release a model run on Tuesday. Okay. Right. Um, and so uh, I would tell you, ma'am, that, that there isn't, there isn't, um, the way we think of it isn't who wins because no, no, we I know, are communities I know. that have yeah, to be together, you know. right? Yeah, um, I'm a modeling. I'm a baby when it comes to, to to these sorts of things. So yeah, I get so, it. So what I would say is that across that, that clock, um, there are improvements and benefits to our system yeah. in Lake Okeechobee ecology um, yeah, performance and, is less. Right, and to clarify for people who are listening to us, everybody is going to win something. So we're not the goal. We're not making anything worse. We're making things better. So I didn't mean to say who wins. Sorry. But thank you. You're welcome, ma'am. May I please say something? Okay. Um, I think I'm on the right path here, <clears throat> but I might not be. So... Um, just thinking at the, at the, I guess it was, when were you going to give your final outcome? November 2nd. 2nd. Yes. So on November 2nd, mm -hmm. the public, let's just put it that way, was expecting um, a determination of what all this would be for mm -hmm. everyone. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of um, pressure. I mean, it's, this is extremely intense. And um, you all, had so much information that you decided to step back for until November 16th to make that determination. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, so the information that we're looking at is the earlier information. And the final information that you put forth on the 16th may or may not be exactly like this. We don't know. You all are reconsidering all things. You have not made up your minds yet. The, the, the final determination has not been made. Is that right? So for us to sit here and, and go through all of the charts and everything again is, I'm sorry, is just, um, we've, for those who've been on the calls and everything, they've, they've seen the charts and it's very important. But um, we, I, I would think for myself, I'm not, I feel like I've looked at this information already. Well, I think Ms. Fellows is just trying to give us a recap. Right. I just think for the you guys, this is so complex. When the public is watching this, they think this is it. Okay? This is not it. We have until November 16th when, when that is it. I just want to make that clear. This is very complicated, mm -hmm. and, and it lasts so long for people. And uh, I just want to make it, I just think we need to be clear that Yes, this, we're not going to sit up here today as the governing board and make a determination on this information. The Army Corps and everybody else who's been doing this will be, with the input, 
will be making that determination. Because it looks like you're putting it up here for us to make a decision. And I don't think that's what we're doing today. Yeah, yes, ma'am. And, and to clarify, and thank you for, for pointing that out. What we are describing are characteristics of, of a final model that we will use. But these are the characteristics we're looking at. These aren't final decisions. We're describing what we're trying to show to the public when we're, when we're getting this feedback. Uh, and, 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 and Ms. Meads, I want to kind of get back to one of your perspectives and, and to, to carry on with what Ms. Thurlow just mentioned is this is complicated. Uh, I've, been, I've been in this for about three months. The, the team, the broader team, multiple years uh, and spent a lot of time on trying to take something that is very, very complicated. Uh, obviously, boil it down when we're trying to talk to the public so it can be understandable. Uh, but I also want to point out it's a hard decision. It's a hard recommendation for the team to look at this, f sit through meetings for multiple months, make relationships with a lot of stakeholders, hear the honest passion that is there, uh, and, then, and, and then make a recommendation or try to develop the information that gets us to a recommendation. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a visual of, of kind of another way of looking at this problem. But if you just imagine the globe of the world, kind of right in, in here in this area, kind of floating in front of us, and, and, and Chairman Goss, you, you see China, and you tell me, we've got to focus on China. China is important, and, and I agree, China's important. Executive Director Bartlett sees North America, and he says, North America is important. We can't forget about uh, sea level rise in North America, and, and that, that is right. You could have someone who's sitting up top looking down and saying the North Pole is important and we've got to focus on, on the Arctic or, or uh, other views. So we're getting all these different views from many stakeholders. None of those views are wrong. And a lot of them come from a point of passion that I mentioned before. And, 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 and the challenge that we work with, that the team works with, is taking all that input and recognizing that we're not looking at China, we're not looking at North America, we're not looking at the North Pole, we are looking at a globe. Right? We are looking at the central and southern Florida system um, particularly how we operate Lake Okeechobee changes or moves, moves the needle in that system. And it's, it's not a simple process, and, and hats off to everybody for giving us that feedback. But so we're describing what's, what's got us there, and, and then the team will come to me early next week with a recommendation after continuing to take feedback on how these different strings get pulled in the system and the impacts that it have, and, and we'll make the decision based on all that feedback for what's the most balanced approach that we can take for the next few years while we continue to put more infrastructure in the ground to, to improve what's going on with the, all the different functions of Lake Okeechobee. So I just, I just wanted to take that opportunity because I appreciate that perspective. And with the public online, I wanted to take a, a, an opportunity to describe the, the complexity and the struggles that we're working with, uh, but trying to come to a fair science-based decision when we, when we do roll that out next week. So. I don't know if it added to the questions or the concerns, but I just want to take it. Thank you. Thank you. And that does help. And it's just nice to have a little bit of general conversation because sometimes the charts and everything just are, are very difficult to um, digest. And I think for people watching, a lot of people watch these um, uh, videos. Uh, so, you know, we know you're doing a great job, and I, I thank you very much. And, uh, I'll let Chauncey finish, you know, talk here, but I, I just, um, I know all together we will, we will win. We will all be winners. Thank thanks, you. Colonel Booth, for that. Uh, Vice Chair Wagner. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Colonel, for coming. Uh, I just wanted to put a, maybe a fine point on this because I think, I think we're talking about what is the takeaway of, of today's presentation. And, and it seems to me... Um, maybe you can sort of confirm this, but this was at least my takeaway, is that you originally were working off CC, that you engaged stakeholders and put down a variety of different issues that were important to people, and that's what you based your optimization now on. <clears throat> and you all have run nearly a quarter of a million uh, models to get to where we are now based on that input. And I think to Jackie's point, uh, the process continues, and you're trying to optimize the optimization to get to as close a center point on that chart Cheryl refers to for all people, right? I mean, would that be a correct 
Generally, yes, sir. Okay. I, I appreciate it. There's a lot of ways you can describe it, but, but yes. Okay. We're continuing to try and fine tune that plan uh, to get it as best as we can. And, 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 and what I'll close out was we, we believe whatever alternative model run we pick that we then take and over the next few months wrap the, the words around, it's, it's going to be better uh, than what you saw in that black line on the spider chart. It's going to be better than LORS 08. Yeah, to me, the takeaway from this entire presentation is that, you know, I, this is a tremendous example of you know, maybe the best intersection of government and citizenship and, and stakeholders because you've got federal, state, local, tribal, citizens, stakeholders, and we're all basically working with one another to try to find the best solution for everyone. Um, and I, I, I think that should be the takeaway for most people out there because it's, it's incredibly encouraging uh, to see this thing work, I think, even in a challenging, complex situation the way that it's working now. And so I appreciate that, and thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Ms. Mage. And when it's all said and done, if you could take one of those spidery graphs for me and throw <laughs> CC back in it so I can see. It's, what, it's is it already in yeah, there? Yeah, it's the blue one. It's the blue one. Okay. It's all good. All right. Ms. Fellows, you want to come on back? And <laughs> I've I got a question. Oh, never mind. Sure. Mr. Bergeron. And I'll try to make it brief. That's difficult. This is a big subject. But, uh, uh, you know, this is kind of a balancing act between the environment and water supply and flood protection. Seems to me like Lake Okeechobee, what we're getting ready to establish is certain amount of impacts are going to be shifted there to temporarily uh, as we build more reservoirs and be able to store this water that laid on half the Everglades that we drained where we live today, uh, things will get better and better as we go forward. Uh, the thing that I see extremely important is moving water south, and we look forward to working with you, Colonel, and and your staff to remove the barriers at the southern end of this bathtub so we have a constant flow of the average rainfall that flowed naturally from the northern Everglades to Florida Bay. Uh, and we've been successful enough to work with you on the seepage wall so we don't have to shut off Shark River Slough uh, flowage because of a, a trigger gauge, and, and that mitigation uh, is being built as we speak. Uh, also, we're working um, our staff, and I want to compliment our staff, on putting additional culverts in the L-28. And if you look at a satellite aerial, you'll see the ridge and sloughs uh, flowing southwest to the 10,000 islands by gravity naturally. You can see it. But we have to put in these culverts in the L-28, and we have to model the Tamiami Trail uh, to make sure there's adequate culverts and flow and model loop road. So as that additional flow, <coughs> naturally by gravity, uh, goes to the 10,000 islands, it can get beyond the Tamiami Trail and loop road. And we look forward to working with you on that. We're also working with uh, uh, a total blueprint on the S-12 closures and uh, 343 NB closures and 344 closures nine months out of the year. That's totally unnatural, shifting all the water to the east side of Shark River Slough rather than what science says 60 here and 40 here or 70 and 30. So this is something that will help the discharges out of our rivers once we get this bottom in opened up where we have constant flow year round, uh, it's certainly going to help the discharges that we're trying to minimize the volume of water greater than natural affecting our estuaries and obviously help the seagrass stop dying in Florida Bay from lack of water. So as we make this decision, I think we can continue to improve it 
by virtue of us working together to get this bottom end opened up where that natural flow is reestablished. And I don't know if there's a certain amount of water in your calculations that, that is gonna go south based upon Losum. Do, do you have uh, a certain Thank amount you, of Mr. Volume you're estimating that's gonna go south? Yes, sir. So oh, that's actually the last thing that I wanted to cover. And so thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about those key characteristics, sir. So if you'll notice that the, there's that big green arrow there in the center of the screen that talks about how the Losan plan will <coughs> preserve the opportunity to send water south from Lake Okeechobee um, all the way down to the Lake Okeechobee Water Shortage Management <coughs> Band. And so the number that we're looking at associated with that on average annual is about 200,000 acre feet per year from, from lake. lake Okeechobee south. Um, okay. that's, that's the average number that we're looking at. Some of them are, are a little bit better, um, but really they're around that number. Okay. And when the bottom end is opened up and modified water delivery is, is running consistently, not cut off by the eight and a half square mile area and shut water off and shut the S-12s because of a bird that don't exist. And when we get all of this, constantly are we uh, gonna be able to send more water south and less east and west? Yes. Okay, that's, that's a good thing. Sorry, I spoke so long. That's Mr. quite Chair, all right. <laughs> you done? Mr. Chair, yeah, I, I, I want, <laughs> I'm actually really grateful for this discussion. Um, and so where I, where I wanted to, to leave it with, sir, if that's sure. okay with you, I just wanted to cover those, those key characteristics because it really is the highlight. Um, and so I wanted to make sure we're all together on that, right? If we look at the schedule, this visual helps us understand um, how we would move water uh, out of the lake. Um, and so what I want you to really look at is that zone D. It's very, very large. Um, it sends zero flows to the east. It sends beneficial flows to the west. It sends water south all the way down, provides for water supply, keeps our community safer. Um, we have the additional protection of the levee itself. And so really big picture, that's what I wanted to leave with you today um, from the technical perspective is um, I do have a, a comparison to Laura's, but I don't think we should go there today. I just wanted to show you um, the improvements that we're making in the logic and in the philosophy of Lucen, and we'll have lots of words to wrap around that uh, coming soon. And then I will just close from our position is, is on top of a, from a very large perspective. Uh, thanks from the Army Corps of Engineers for working with us. Uh, thank you for your championship at the state level and the funding that the state is, state's doing, the, the efforts that the district is doing today, putting projects in ground, uh, and, and, and to the, the constituents of the state of Florida who are, who are paying taxes that, that help on that side. And from a federal perspective, uh, your efforts uh, speaking up, up to Washington, D.C., uh, and along with, with, with the federal efforts that do secure funding uh, to allow us to continue to put more of this infrastructure uh, operational plans in place uh, to improve uh, the overall operation of the central and southern Florida system. And we appreciate the partnership and looking forward to many years to come of continuing, as you said, Mr. Bergeron, uh, to, to let the system get better, help the system get better and, and flow water appropriately, more like what it used to in the past. So thank you very much. Thanks, Colonel. Vice Chair Wagner. Yes, I just want to make a quick comment on this particular graph because I think it, it's 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 a good opportunity uh, to do it uh, based on not only our cooperation over the years but also um, some of the historic uh, uh, reliance on the district as it related to uh, some of the operational. And I think it, one of your earlier slides touched on. Um, well, one of the earlier slides certainly talked about what the next steps were after after we get to optimization here, which I think is the drafting of the EIS and the water control plan and some of the language that goes in. Um, and for us, I think if we're in, you know, if you had to ask the people here, what is maximum stress time? What is maximum pain time? 
it's after the water shortage ban is triggered. Uh, not only is that stressful, I think, for our stakeholders, obviously, but also stressful in terms of how much needs to be mobilized from an equipment personnel standpoint to actually deal with what happens once you cross that threshold. And so we do have a very large zone D, I think, that's being contemplated now. Um, I guess what I would say is perhaps, and maybe it is time, you know, the next round is where the language goes, but hopefully there would be some language in there um, that would give us the ability uh, for you guys to rely on us to make decisions for stakeholders here as we get down towards the bottom part of the zone D uh, zone, which I think, you know, gets people will, you know, if this is the, the model that goes and whatnot and how it looks, you know, that's where people start getting, I think, pretty nervous. Um, and I think from a from a state standpoint and from a state stakeholder standpoint, um, it'd be good to have the same type of language that we had, you know, it seems previously in terms of relying on the district and for, for allocation to users. Uh, uh, chime in. I, I appreciate Scott's comments, um, Wagner's comments, because that is, um, you know, I mean, that, that's one of our one of our jobs here, and um, and certainly providing deference at the bottom end of the schedule to the South Florida Water Management District when it comes to some of those releases um, and making those decisions. Because um, at the end of the day, buck stops here when it comes to water supply. You know, certainly authorized purposes, navigation recreation on the bottom end of this lake schedule uh, with the Army Corps, but, uh, but when it comes to allocating water supply for the environment, water supply for, for, for users, for, for the public, for drinking water, for, for irrigation purposes, um, and, um, and whatever, when writing this thing, whatever, whatever deference you can give to the district, we'd appreciate, um, especially put it in writing. <laughs> yeah. um, the other thing, I, I've kind of been quiet. I think we're getting towards the end of the presentation. We've jumped in. We 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 got a copy of your slides here on the thing, and I just I've lost track. They don't have page numbers. I don't even know what goes where. I've been flipping all over. Um, but um, I do think we've missed an opportunity. Um, the Excel spreadsheet, this latest 707 runs that meet the Corps' critical objectives, which were what uh, dam safety. Um, <laughs> I forget which ones. Was that what narrowed the like 240 down to 707 runs or something like that? We missed an opportunity of partnering maybe with uh, with the tribes of um, horse betting. Let's bet on which one, which, which run the core is going to pick. I think we may have missed an opportunity here. Now that sports betting is legal, we may have missed an opportunity. <laughs> but um, uh, but with that, would you bring back up slide 28 and? which kind of goes to that Excel spreadsheet y'all put together. I want to say thank y'all for putting that together. I enjoyed playing with it. Um, you know, for those that are Excel nerds or macro, I mean, the macros that are put in here, you could put in your parameters and pick your horse, essentially, is where I was going with that. And, uh, and I've picked my horse. I'm not going to share my horse at all. But um, uh, I've, got, I've got a fleet. I've got a whole herd of horses that I've picked. But, um, but with all the different parameters, of course, there's, I mean, you can add in all kinds of parameters. You know, of course, one of the two things that I'm looking at um, on this particular sheet, it shows up pretty good. It's those three red columns on the left. Um, I think we knew going into Losom that with Herbert Hoover Dyke being rehabbed, the ability to stack water higher, that, um, you know, Lake Ecology was, um, was going to suffer. Um, you know, these three red columns on the left, I mean, they show it. We're, we're you know, and, and it just, it, I think it goes to further prove we've got to complete CERT. We've got to get more storage into the system. We've got to get authorization for the rest of CERT. Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Plan, we've got to get authorization for it. We've got, you know, commitment from the state. We're putting, we're putting more storage in. We've got the EAA going. Storage south, storage north, we still need more storage. And once Losom is done, once Losom's done, wrapped up, we've tied a bow on it, maybe before we've tied a bow on it. Um, I talked about it at the last meeting. 
it's time to start taking the next step because Losum's not going to solve our problems. We're still going to have these red columns on the Caloosahatchee, the red columns on the St. Lucie, the red columns on Lake Okeechobee Ecology, and the red columns on water supply. We need additional storage in the system. And, um, and I hope that we can work towards fostering a new partnership with the Corps and look at new storage opportunities beyond CERT. And it's, 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 it's about time to start taking that step. Um, those are the couple points I wanted to get across. Um, you know, when I bet on my horse race, I'll tell you the parameters I looked at. I looked at uh, time above 16 feet. Um, the number, I wish, I wish the parameter of number, number of times above 17 feet were on that Excel spreadsheet. I would have played with that one. Uh, I looked at the MFLs. I looked at the, uh, I sorted by those, and then I, th then I sorted and looked at the Caloosahatchee discharges and St. Lucie discharges and picked my, picked my horses from there. But that's just kind of the thought process I went through. Um, deference to the state of Florida when it comes to the bottom end of the schedule. And, um, and then moving forward, we need to start planning the next step. Those are the two points I want to get across through this discussion. But I want to appreciate all the work you've done. I appreciate y'all presenting to us today. And, um, you know, look forward to next Tuesday. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Mr. Olipich. I have hesitated <clears throat> to get involved saying too much today because I think we're so far down the road here. Your decision is coming very soon. And so many people have been part of where we've gotten to today, including this board um, at an earlier time. And um, you know that, it was hard for me what happened up here, but I'll talk about it now since it's all out here. But you know, of course we want the Caloosahatchee to do better, but we also want the St. Lucie to do better too. And all things aside, water shortages, water supply, the whole thing, if, we're, if we really look at why we're here today, why this board is here today, what Governor DeSantis brought in with Executive Order 1912, it was because the estuaries screamed for all we went through, particularly from 2013 to 2018. We must remember 2016 when the St. Lucie River was full of toxic algae, when it was coming out of the St. Lucie Inlet and washing up on the shore. We must remember what happened in 2018 um, in uh, Lee County with animals dying on the beaches in piles, putrid piles. That is why we're really here today. And so my hope is that this schedule, more than anything, benefits our estuaries. And I'm sorry. That is why we're here. And in time, every, you know, we will all come together. Things will get better. But we, we, sometimes it's like a sunburn. You forget it when it goes away. We have to remember why we're here. We're here. This board is here because of what happened to the estuaries. So thank you so much, everyone. And um, I'll leave it at that. And, and Ava, thank you so much. I didn't mean to turn into a teacher, get bent out of shape. Ma'am, you You do just a great fine. job. Thank you very much. You're fine. And thank thank you, you, Colonel. Uh, thanks, Mr. Holbitch. I'd like to reiterate a couple of things that have been said. First of all, thank you all for this process. It's, it's been wonderful. It's been transparent. It's been open. You've encouraged uh, participation, and that's I, I know it's not something you have to do, and, and I really appreciate it as a stakeholder um, and as a citizen, a resident of Florida. So I thank you. To, my hat's off to the Corps for doing this. It's, a, it's been a great process. Um, I agree with Mr. Olipich. We do need to make it better for the estuaries, and I think you have. Or actually, I know you have. When I look at your model runs, they're better for the estuaries than what we have today, and that, that is a huge step in the right direction. I'd also like to jump on something that um, Vice Chair Wagner and, and Mr. Butler said, which is when we get to the lower, lower ends, um, and this is something I talked to Colonel Kelly about maybe a year, year and a half ago, was don't put us in a position where 
we have to be reactive all the time. You know, let us be a little proactive. If we see the train coming down the tracks and things look like it's going to be really bad, let us start to do things that are going to make it so it's not really bad, so it's just a little bad. And that's, that, I'll sort of leave it with that. Leave us that flexibility, and that may be more in the words than in the actual model runs. With that, thank you all very much. Uh, Ms. Roman, or Colonel Roman, uh, Mr. Martinez, do you have anything you want to say? You, you've been quiet, and I know you're there. No, Mr. Chair, I'm good. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Th thank you all very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. Uh, we'll go to general uh, public comment now. Um, this is the first public comment period. If you're here to comment on a specific agenda item, um, the board and I kindly ask that you hold your comment until we reach that item on the agenda. Um, this comment period is for general comments, not related to agenda items, although if you want to talk about LOSM, you're certainly welcome to. And I appreciate everyone's help in running an efficient meeting on public comments and consent agenda. Uh, is item 13 on the agenda. Um, we received a couple of written comments in advance of today's meeting. They are posted on the district's website. Um, we'll, as always, hear from elected officials first. Rosie, and if we have any comments from the public, we'd love to hear them. We do, Mr. Chairman. We have Commissioner Greg Weiss from Palm Beach County, followed by Commissioner Sarah Hurd from Martin County. Commissioner Weiss had to, to take an exit to go to a delegation meeting. Thank you. Commissioner Sarah Hurd. Good morning, all. I'm S Martin County Commissioner Sarah Hurd. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Martin County would like to express its strong support for the C-25 project land acquisition item today and for the completion of all aspects of the Indian River Lagoon South SERP program. These projects were authorized as Generation 1 SERP projects in Warda 2007. They are all critical to the restoration of one of the most biodiverse estuarine systems in the world. The C-25 project will provide local and regional benefits to the lagoon by reducing nutrient and sediment loading loading, attenuating flows, and providing seasonal flexibility to regional water supply needs. I, we would also like to extend our gratitude for district staff's support of a Florida Forever project application that's going before the Acquisition and Restoration Council in December. This proposed project would acquire 2,000 more acres within the Allapatta natural storage area and treatment component of IRL South. This addition would also qualify in the state share of the SERP cost share ledger. We have a willing seller. The hydrologic restoration would be very simple and cost effective, and it would restore some of the best wetland habitat in the uh, Allopata system. There are very limited exotics, and the upland portions are typical of the Florida natural areas inventory standards for outstanding ecosystems. District staff, especially Mr. Bartlett, have provided terrific support for this application, and we're grateful for their willingness to incorporate it into the management of the Allopata complex, and especially for the district's continued support of the SERP natural lands component, which I think may be the most prescient of all of the SERP projects. In Martin County, we have prohibited any urban development outside of our urban service boundaries. So our western lands, are relatively undisturbed, completely undisturbed in many areas. So certainly they're more, uh, they're less expensive to acquire for SERP restoration, and the work that needs to be done is less expensive also, uh, with the result that the uh, inhabitants we're seeking to recruit, the birds, can fly to their new, healthy, restored habitat. And I'd also like to thank the board and the district staff for your extraordinary efforts and your successes in managing and in restoring a vast and unique ecosystem that is the South Florida Water Management District. It's a daunting task, and you really excel at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hurd. I have a comment card from County Commissioner Franny Hutchinson. Did you want to speak now or at item 31? Thank you. Next we have Ryan Rossi, followed by Newton Cook, and then Dan DeLisi. Good 
Good morning. Uh, thank you for your time. Ryan Rossi with the South Florida Water Coalition. Um, I just want to, I want to clarify, we can comment on LOSUM, is that correct? Okay. Um, I, I want to comment on that specifically as it relates to uh, our water supply. You know, I attended uh, last Friday the South Florida and Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council virtual workshop. I found that to be very informative. There was a lot of good uh, information with regard to a lot of water-related matters uh, that I think are incredibly important to the future of our area. Uh, and I have to thank the, the South Florida Water Management District also for their presentations uh, within that workshop, um, especially with regard to um, sea level rise resiliency measures that I think uh, you know, we're gonna be talking a lot about as we go forward. Uh, but that being said, in one of the presentations, there were two facts that stood out to me. Uh, one was that um, between now and 2040, our, our, uh, the population of South Florida is expected to increase by 26%. In addition to that, the gross water demand is expected to increase by 14%. That's between now and 2040. So it, it seems like 2040 is a long way off. It's really not. Um, and I think, not to borrow Mr. Chair's uh, phrasing before, but this is the train that we see coming down the track. And if we don't begin to plan for accommodating these changes, and I'm talking about with spe uh, water supply specifically, um, I, I think that we are really putting our citizens in great danger if we don't start making accommodations for, for smart and sensible management. And we cannot forget that Lake Okeechobee plays a role in our regional water supply. We cannot separate the lake from the supply needs that we have here in South Florida. So I, I just wanna reemphasize that as LOSIM is being finalized, um, and we're all working alongside the core stakeholders, uh, water management district, um, that you, you keep the citizens' interests in mind as you finalize these plans, particularly for supply when we know that these percentages could be even greater in the next uh, 10 or 20 years. We're gonna face sea level rise consequences, no doubt about it. We're gonna face a drought at some point. We can't pretend like we're not going to. There's gonna be a shortage. We have to acknowledge that. And uh, we're gonna uh, face some other environmental difficulties that we have to acknowledge. Uh, and we have to acknowledge that our populations are increasing and make accommodations for that with our supply. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Rossi. Newton Cook is our ne next public speaker, followed by Dan DeLisi and then Eve Samples. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Newton Cook. I'm speaking today for United Water Followers of Florida. Uh, duck season is, kicks off for the youth hunt this Saturday. Thanks to you guys for helping us do those things. Uh, first of all, uh, Ms. Herb, Alafala is such a wonderful place. Yes, and we look forward to adding another couple of thousand acres out there. Uh, with the C44 complex, this is gonna be an incredible place for recreation. And uh, actually gonna be some duck hunting occasionally in places. Uh, I also wanna say uh, December 13th here is the next uh, recreation meeting. And uh, it should be an interesting meeting cause it's right in the middle of the fishing and hunting and the people are coming down and, and uh, wanting to go out on the properties and recreate. I uh, also want to thank the Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel, for all your services. And uh, you don't know how many times I've had to defend you for digging that darn ditch for the Kissimmee River and then filling it back in. And uh, I tell people, these guys, they do what they're ordered to do. You know, you can't jump on them too much. You tell them to dig a ditch, they'll dig it. You tell them to fill it in, they'll fill it in. But now I'm going to talk to you about the lake. I was on the lake... Oh, Okeechobee rack for about five years. We were trying to save the rack from the last time it was trying to be destroyed. Mother Nature was trying to destroy it last time. We're trying to destroy it this time. Absolutely no excuse for putting that lake at 17 and a half feet. We had 16 and a half feet for years and years and years and years, and we managed to keep a pretty good lake, except when we had big storms. What do the storms do? They run it to 17 and a half feet. What happens? Irma, five years later, where are we? Last year, we lost 75% of all the SAV in the lake. And it was just a little storm because we had never recovered from Irma yet. We don't have the marshes that we need to clean the water to send better water south, east, and west. If you run the lake to 17 and a half feet, it'll take five years to get the vegetation back. In five years, we'll have three storms. 
the lake starts being damaged at 15 feet. Now, we did real well at 16 and a half. It wasn't perfect, but we did all well. My suggestion, change the 17 and a half to 16 and a half. Go back where we were. We dropped it to 15 and a half to repair the dike. That's fine. Now we repaired the dike. Now go back to 16 and a half. You take it to 17 and a half feet, you're going to have a mud hole. I was out there yesterday. Wall to wall water. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Dan DeLisi, followed by Eve Samples and then Nyla Pipes. So, uh, Dan DeLisi, for the record, I'm here on behalf of Lee County today. Um, just to start out, while I'm up here, would like to echo Commissioner Hurd's comments. IRL Natural Lands is a fantastic project, and, and everybody's thankful for the district support on that. Um, I do want to make some comments about uh, lake operations and how they impact the Caloosahatchee. Uh, last week, the Corps announced that uh, they would start releases to the Caloosahatchee in an effort to start lowering uh, Lake Okeechobee or do a gradual recession. Uh, the 2000 CFS um, proposed at S79 was um, considered to be a positive amount of flow. Uh, it is in our recover PM optimal range. Um, but we wanted to put a few things on the record to be clear so that they're not misunderstood. And I'm, I'm channeling our scientists, uh, Dr. Peter Doring and Susan, um, who are uh, a lot uh, kinder and, and sometimes more indirect on, on these things. So we just wanted to be clear. We don't think, nor did we request, that the core start uh, releases now to lower the lake. Uh, it's certainly not our desire to get 2,000 CFS at this point in time. Uh, the recover performance metric that, of course, we thought was an improvement over the last performance metric uh, that places the optimal flow between 750 and 2,100 CFS is fine because there are times throughout the year where things in that range would make sense or flows in that range would make sense. But it's not the case that 2100 CFS at all times of the year is, is an optimal amount of flow. Uh, there is seasonality to that, which we need to be aware of. Um, and obviously, if you were to have a full year of 2100 CFS constantly, that's not an optimal flow range for us. So uh, seasonality needs to be considered. Um, the third thing is uh, oysters are not the only indicator for estuary health. Of course, the South Florida Water Management District has done a lot of research on this. When I was here, uh, we did a big workshop at FTCU looking at ecological indicators. And it doesn't just come down to oysters. And of course, Lee County is very concerned with tape grass. Uh, the district has done research on light penetration and how it affects seagrass growth or tape grass. Um, and so we would, um, we would certainly uh, hope that you consider this when you look at uh, releases. Uh, finally, just uh, segueing into low sum, I do want to thank the Corps for listening to us. Uh, 2018 was a miserable year for us, and certainly we did not want to see any low sum uh, option that made things worse for us. I think the balance that's being achieved now uh, is positive, and um, uh, we are concerned about lake levels, to be sure, because we get that water. Uh, but um, but we appreciate the direction you all are going in. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. DeLisi. Our next public commenter is Eve Samples, followed by Nyla Pipes, and then Tom McVicker. Good morning, Governing Board members, Chairman Goss, Director Bartlett, Colonel Booth. I'm Eve Samples. I'm Executive Director at Friends of the Everglades. appreciate you taking our comments today. We were founded in 1969 by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, and we got involved in the Lowson battle three years ago because we wanted to reduce harm that we saw occurring to the estuaries. We saw massive volumes of water being transferred from Lake Okeechobee, carrying toxic algae blooms onto populated communities. That's why many of you are sitting on the dais today, and that continues to be our main focus. Colonel Booth, you've had a baptism by fire. <laughs> Engagement is deep and real on this issue, and uh, we apologize for your inbox inundation in recent days, but I want you to know that there are, are real people 
behind this feedback. It's not just those of us who stand up here and focus on these issues full time. There are people with other passions in the world that also really care about preventing toxic algae from being transferred into their backyards. So we believe CC was the right plan to start with, and we expected the optimization in the categories that the Army Corps of Engineers announced. So reduction of harm to the Caloosahatchee estuary was expected, uh, improvement of water supply for the Seminole Tribe of Florida was expected, we supported that. And also we expected, even if we disagreed, with maintaining the CC-like performance for the water supply in other areas, including LOSA. Um, I think it's worth noting, became, because it came up earlier today, that the Lake Okeechobee service area, yes, it does provide municipal water to the city of Okeechobee, for example, but the vast majority of LOSA goes to hundreds of thousands of acres of EAA farms south of Lake Okeechobee. So that's worth noting. The opposite of optimization is diminishment. What we did not expect during this process was such a dis diminishment of um, performance to the St. Lucie estuary. So if you looked at, back at that table that was giving us all a little consternation earlier today, if you compared the volumes going to the St. Lucie under CC to the eight model runs that the Corps pre presented during its optimization, the volumes roughly doubled. We don't think that's true optimization. The good news is there's still time to make the right call. We support eliminating zones D2 and D3 in the ultimate run that's chosen and announced next week by the Army Corps. We also support eliminating the conservation mode that's contemplated. Um, we think the water shortage management ban does a fine job lowering the lake early in the season, can also help the lake later on. So it's, it's essential that we choose the right model run. All of you have an important voice and a role to play in these final days of LOSUM, and we ask that you seize on them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Samples. Next, we have Nyla Pipes, followed by Tom McVicker, and then Ernie Barnett. Good morning, everyone. Nyla Pipes, One Florida Foundation. I also am going to speak on LOSUM. I'm sure that's no surprise to any of you. Um, and some of this you will have heard before, but sometimes repetition is what gets people thinking a little broader. First and foremost, I have to echo Newton Cook's concerns about Lake Okeechobee. And as Ms. Samples just pointed out, there are very real people who have those same concerns, who rely on Lake Okeechobee for more than just water supply, but also for navigation, recreation, fishing, tourism, a lifestyle. A lot of people in our urban communities tend to think that they are disconnected from the lake other than when the lake is discharging on us. But water supply for grassy waters comes from Lake Okeechobee. That's the water supply for West Palm Beach. So this is all very interconnected. It's no small feat to try to come up with something that has a balance for all of those project purposes for LOSUM. The project purposes are flood control, water supply, navigation, recreation, and preservation of fish and wildlife. When you look every month at the Ecological Conditions Report, Lake Okeechobee has a, a band where it does best if it stays within it. And Lake Okeechobee, just like the Caloosahatchee, needs both high and low water. It can't go too low and it can't go too high for too long. The main concern that I am hearing boots on the ground in all of the Okeechobee area, all around the lake, and for people who travel for miles and miles and miles, some coming from as far as Tallahassee to recreate on the lake, is that if we kill this lake, what do we have left? Right? So we have to really consider the ecological conditions of the lake because it is the liquid heart of the Everglades. On that note, I also just want to say that we can't just send it all south. Not only can we not just send it all south because we don't have the infrastructure in place, because this is not SERP, we can't just send it all south because the central Everglades and the southern Everglades also 
need to ebb and flow with the seasons. It needs to be water in, water out, yes. But we also have to remember that the Everglades is a fire-dependent system, and it needs its own ecological recovery. So this is complex. I know you guys know that, but I just wanted to bring up a few points. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pipes. Our next public commenter is Tom McVicker, followed by Ernie Barnett, and then Jake Foytick. Hi. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Goss, members of the board, it's nice to see you again in person. It's been a while. I'm here to talk about LOSUM. But I want to start by uh, acknowledging that I am privileged to represent the lakeside communities in the LOSUM PDT process. They didn't hire me to speak to you, but I'm going to unle unload some of my background that I've gained in that. And those communities are the counties of Hendry, Glades, and Okeechobee, as well as the cities of Clewiston, Okeechobee, and Moorhaven. I have separate arrangements with each of those and the Okeechobee Utility Authority. Uh, it was gratifying to see the board in Okeechobee last month. It was especially gratifying to see how you warmed up to the people, embraced the values of the community and the public. Um, and we had a similar chance a couple weeks ago with Colonel Booth in Belglade. He, I think, spent a whole day driving down and back <laughs> to spend some time with some of the key people that make the south end of the lake their home. And there's a lot of history there, too. So I'm, I like to look at both of those things as the start of developing the kind of rapport with those two communities that you have with some of the other communities that are here more often and that outnumber us by thousands and thousands. It, it was much less gratifying to see that spreadsheet that you all have been talking about. Uh, Lake Okeechobee is the key to these communities. The recreational economy is big. They all live by it and they live on it. And water supply is the other big issue. What's clear and pointed out by several speakers, every metric for every alternative of those eight was bad for Lake Okeechobee. None of the other metrics are anywhere like that. We went back to the 707. There were no good alternatives in the 707. We went to the 240,000. We found two that one was actually better for the lake. Another one was not quite as bad. We submitted those to the core. Uh, both of them were adequate on water supply. We know the core can't pick them, but there's got to be a marker in the ground for Lake Okeechobee and water supply because the two are compatible. You can't just throw one away at the expense of the other. My final comment, we don't buy that you could patch over the problems with words in the EIS or words in the water control plan. They have to be on the schedule. Look at the words the core put on this schedule. A little footnote down at the bottom. The agency responsible for allocating water from Lake Okeechobee is the South Florida Water Management District. I don't know what that means. I don't think it means anything to the core. I think it means you all have this little paperwork exercise down here that you do, but the core controls the water. And they've got the freedom to run the lake with the real water down to the water shortage zone. No one's going to say they're going to do that today. You'll say, we'll never let them do that. They've done that. You have to have it in the schedule, not in a bunch of vague language in the EIS or the water control plan. And we'll be looking for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vicker. Ernie Barnett, followed by Jake Foytick. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, thank you. I'm Ernie Barnett with the Florida Land Council. You know, we all wear many hats, and uh, I stand before you as a resident of the South Fork of the St. Lucie, so I care very deeply about LOSUM, which is what I'm here to speak about, but also professionally, and as a former director of uh, state water policy, I, uh, very concerned about the precedential nature of what happens at all the water management districts as it relates to water policy. And I've expressed my concerns to anyone who had listened to me and spent a lot of time with, with Drew and have been very appreciative and thankful of all the time he's given me. And I've also expressed these concerns with DEP that all of the existing model runs uh, prescribe release decisions all the way down to the water shortage band. And there is no zone above that band that hands off that uh, discretion and that uh, deference to the state that I'm, I think is very, very important. And I uh, want to thank uh, Mr. Wagner and Mr. Butler and Chair Goss for your thoughtful words about how important that is. And I agree with my colleague, Mr. McVicker's uh, uh, comments just now that um, I think this deference must be identified in the schedule. Uh, Y'all are the ones that uh, once the Corps is no longer needing to make regulatory releases to manage flood risk and hazard risk to the dike, and that water needs to be distributed for multiple 
uh, water-related needs of the region, including MFLs, environmental purposes, and water supply, those decisions should be vested in this board and with the state of Florida. And that should be included in the schedule. Uh, there should be a band above water shortage that that deference lies with uh, the state. And that deference has always been in every schedule for the last 50 years. And I think it must be included in the schedule, it must be in the final record of decision by the Corps, and must be fully analyzed and vetted through the NEPA process to make it real. And I think that's important for transparency, and I think it's important for the sovereignty of the state of Florida to protect the state's rights to allocate, manage, and protect the water resources of this region. And thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Barnett. Mr. Foytick is our next public commenter. Thank you all for the opportunity. Um, I'm Jake Foytick with the Florida Farm Bureau Federation. Um, wanted to thank Dr. Or Director Bartlett for your presentation. Um, we're encouraged to see the continuation of CERT projects like IRL South. Um, those are so important north of the lake and we're encouraged to see the continuation of all of those. Um, with regards to LOSM, um, thanks to the Army Corps for the presentation and the openness. Um, we and other stakeholders have been very appreciative throughout the process of the opportunity to speak up and for all the vast amount of information that's been provided to us. Um, we are glad to see more focus um, or at least more visibility of work on water supply. Um, in previous meetings, there's been some concern regarding agricultural water supply. Um, so I do feel the need to kind of highlight again um, some of the incredible water quality improvements and water savings reductions and measures that have been put in place uh, through the implementation of best management practices um, for our growers and producers all throughout the state. Um, with the opportunities for cost share and the more accessibility to um, nutrient application and irrigation management components, agricultural producers have had a, a much easier time implementing those BMPs and providing more and more um, water savings throughout the state. Um, did want to thank Mr. Butler and others um, for bringing up the districts and the state's responsibility and directive for decision making in Lake Okeechobee's lower levels. Um, it is y'all's duty and, and all of our duties as, as uh, residents of the state of Florida to protect the state's rights to control that water, especially at lower levels. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foytick. Mr. Chairman, we're going to switch to the virtual world where we have a handful of commenters, hands raised. We're going to start with Poonam Calcutt, followed by Kara Cap, and then Lisa Interlandy. Can you hear me? We hear you. My name is Poonam Calcutt. I am uh, representing the city of West Palm Beach. I'm the director of uh, public utilities there, Mr. Chair, and members of the board. I want to thank the governing board members for staying engaged in the LOSM process. I also want to thank the core and district staff and modelers who have continued to work with the city's modelers, and we really appreciate it. As you're aware, the city of West Palm Beach has continued to express concerns regarding the fast pace of development of the new LOSM schedule and the stakeholders' inability to thoughtfully evaluate the information provided by the Army Corps of Engineers under the schedule. We have been requesting uh, a 90 day extension uh, from the date the Army Corps shared the modeling results with the public and prior to the selection of the tentatively selected plan. Um, the Army Corps on July 6, 2021, identified several iterations, uh, two alternatives for LOSUM. On July 13th, um, the city wrote a letter uh, concern expressing concerns. Uh, that none of the alternatives meaningfully evaluated the Northern Palm Beach area where the city's water supply system is located and which includes the Loxahatchee River, a federally designated wild and scenic river. The city's review of the iteration two alternatives uh, disclosed that the Army Corps model did not properly simulate the city's water supply and the Loxahatchee River. So that when compared to the no action 2025 scenario NB25, none of the alternatives showed any changes. It turned out the Army Corps used the same assumptions and conditions for the Northern Palm Beach area in both the Iteration 2 alternatives and NB25. 
we have brought this flat floor to the attention of uh, Army Corps, and they've been working with us. Um, despite this apparent and significant flaw, the Army Corps has proceeded to complete LOSM um, and has released high-level results for over 240,000 model runs for iteration three, which doubles the amount of data provided in iteration one. Um, and the screening, Army Corps screening process was not released until two weeks after the model data was initially made public over the course of months. Um, these 240,000 runs were whittled down to 707 rounds and then eventually to eight rounds, and the city's consultants have been unable to thoroughly analyze these runs. So we are requesting, even though uh, the Army Corps is in a hurry to complete the LOSIN process, that there is no excuse for making decisions on a flawed model and does not accurately predict the impact of the various alternatives of the Northern Palm Beach area. This area provides critical public water supply to 120,000 residents of the of West Palm Beach, town of Palm Beach, and town of South Palm Beach, and also is home to a number of valuable natural conservation areas such as grassy waters preserve and locks of Hatchie Slough. I thank, uh, I thank the uh, board for taking this uh, conversation further, and I would uh, request that the, we continue to get some more time to look at this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Calcat. Kara Cap, you're recognized to speak, followed by Lisa Interlandy and then Rich B Richard Budell. Good morning, everyone. This is Kara Cap for the National Parks Conservation Association. Um, I hope everyone is doing well this week and enjoying the beautiful weather. I wanted to briefly raise an item that is um, not otherwise on the agenda today, the ongoing development threat in Miami-Dade County. Um, the county is actively considering a proposal to develop an 800-acre industrial and hotel complex out west. It's outside the urban development boundary in an area that is critical for well field protection and currently serves as an important buffer between urban Miami-Dade and the Everglades. The parcel in question also, importantly, is squarely within the proposed project footprint for BB Sear and could be really valuable for restoration. So I'm commenting today because last month the district submitted really strong comments to Miami-Dade County as part of the state review process for this application. And so MPCA wanted to extend our sincere thanks to Executive Director Bartlett and the leadership team here for clearly articulating to the county that this region is critical for Everglades restoration and that there are serious concerns with this um, potential development. The district was not alone in offering this feedback. DEP also submitted similar concerns and from the downstream neighbors in the Florida Keys, Monroe County, um, Isla Mirada, City of Key West, and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary all submitted resolutions urging Miami-Dade to deny this development proposal. We expect that the county will make a final decision either way, late this year or possibly early next year. Um, this board talks so much about restoration, which is critically important, but at the same time, we have to remain vigilant about protection as well. There are still threats, significant threats, to the remaining Everglades habitat and watershed that we are desperately trying to restore, and the district can play a really significant role in safeguarding those resources um, through agency review and comment, like in this letter, through water permitting, through rulemaking, um, so again, MPCA is just extending our appreciation for your leadership on this issue. Um, thank you for the chance to speak today, and I hope you have a positive and productive rest of the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Cap. Next, we have Lisa Interlandy, followed by Richard Budell, and then Holly Milbrandt. Hey there, Lisa Interlandy with the Everglades Law Center. Um, I'm also going to comment on LOSUM. I do want to praise both the core and the water management district, particularly the modeling teams. I mean, I, it's kind of um, awe-inspiring, honestly, how you guys um, figure all this stuff out. So for the general public, it's um, pretty amazing, the work that you're doing. So we're, we're really pleased to see it. Um, I know that it is hard to see that the benefits being reduced um, from Plan CC in parts of the system in the St. Lucie, also in the Lake Worth Lagoon to a lesser extent, but um, it is good to see the improvements in other parts of the system. I mean, both those things needed to happen and we hope that you will be able to continue to improve the plan over the next week. Um, we are still pleased to see the reduction in flows to the Lake Worth Lagoon. I hope that you won't surprise us by significantly changing um, any of the of the plans that you will ultimately decide to move forward with. 
you know, I just, um, I also think it's really clear that there is a need to move forward with other projects and more projects, whether it's more storage, um, more water quality treatment, there is a need to continue moving um, projects forward, certainly. And um, as far as the threat to water supply, as particularly when you're talking about urban water supply, it seems that the water quality in the lake has historically been more, posed more of a threat to water supply on the Lower East Coast than the lake levels. Um, there's been several times in the last few years when water was not available to come to the Lower East Coast because of the quality. And that has nothing to do with lake levels. And in fact, higher lake levels are going to continue to exacerbate that. So I, I, would, I would urge that the focus be on trying to resolve that problem as well. And um, I also do support the um, continued ability to send water south and to the estuaries all the way down to the water shortage line. That has proven to work. And um, that, that can prove to work, I believe, going forward. And um, the state does maintain its right to allocate water. Um, that is very clearly allowed under the plan. So um, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Ms. Interlandy. Richard Bedell, you're recognized to speak, followed by Holly Milbrandt. Mr. Budell, if you could unmute your mic. Mr. Budell, if you could unmute your mic. Press star six to unmute your mic, please. Okay, we're going to go to Holly Melbrant, and then I'll circle back to Mr. Budell. Good morning. Can I get a sound check? We can hear you, Ms. Melbrant. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chairman Goss and members of the Governing Board. Uh, Holly Milbrandt, Natural Resources Director for the City of Sanibel. Uh, just wanted to also make a few comments on LOSUM and to thank you and the district staff, uh, Colonel Booth and the core staff for the continued work um, throughout this critically important and challenging process. The city of Sanibel and the West Coast stakeholders had serious concerns with the Corps' decision to move forward with alternative CC. And honestly, we were skeptical that optimization could provide sufficient relief from damaging high flows to the Clusahatchee. Um, it is clear from the uh, results that have been presented over the last couple of weeks and the enormous amount of modeling um, that the Corps has made a concerted effort to achieve the state of goals for optimization and to improve upon what we saw as severe imbalances in alternative CC, specifically for the Clusahatchee. Uh, we have uh, provided written communication to the Corps, urging them to move forward um, with one of the eight optimization runs, 279-349, uh, that was presented within the last couple of weeks as the optimized plan, um, but to continue to explore additional opportunities for further optimization to reduce the extreme damaging discharges uh, greater than 6,500 CFS to the Clusahatchee. Uh, we would support increasing the up to flow amount in zones D2 and D3 to 1,400 CFS, and uh, also would support maximum releases to all outlets in zone A. We look forward to continued collaboration with the district and the core as the final plan is selected and we'll continue to be actively engaged as the operations manual is drafted. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Melbrandt. Next, we have Mike Connor. Yes, good morning, thank you. Yes, Mike Connor, Indian Riverkeeper, based here in Stewart, Florida. Um, on on LOSUM, I just uh, wanted to reiterate a couple of concerns that have been uh, mentioned by previous commenters uh, the lake o recovery mode uh, you know when time comes to lower the lake due to extreme elevation rises what will that really mean in terms of discharge volume and duration of discharges to our river the saint Lucie river you know at times like that extreme wet seasons you got to take into consideration the local and tidal basin runoff from western martin and saint Lucie county rural and residential acreage 
that ends up right in the St. Lucie by way of the South and the North Forks. There are times when upwards of one to two billion gallons of water per day hit this estuary. A lot of folks don't realize that, but even without Lake O discharges, sometimes we have a lot of water to deal with. And our low, our, some of our runoff this year in the summer was upwards of 1.3, 1.4 billion gallons a day. That doesn't seem to be common knowledge, but I'm um, very concerned about that. You know, if Laysome in its final form fails to greatly decrease the Lake O discharges, I can't imagine any ecological recovery will happen for this river or the southernmost in the River Lagoon anytime soon. That's a great concern as well. But in closing, you know, there's no need to conserve additional water in Lake O when Caloosahatchee needs the water, Florida Bay needs the water, and no real water shortage really exists. And I appreciate the time today. And we'll comment on uh, the agenda item this afternoon as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Next, we have Mark Perry, followed by Richard Bedell. Yes, good morning, uh, Governing Board. I appreciate um, the opportunity. It's Mark Perry of Florida Oceanographic uh, Society. We're, we're also concerned about, you know, as we move forward with the LOSM process and making sure we get this um, opportunity to make the schedule right for managing Lake Okeechobee and the discharges and releases um, from the lake. And, and our concern, again, is making sure that uh, that it's it's equitable and that it's and it's moving forward to really reduce these and eliminate the discharges to these northern estuaries that are harmful has been iterated by previous speakers um, particularly because sending that water south as indicated by other board members is really really the key and is important and even before we have the adequate infrastructure so to say that we already have the ability to do that we need to do it and not have these releases going to these northern estuaries. And particular concern is as we kind of tweak the schedule and move forward with getting something in place, um, we're gonna be trying to monitor it closely and obviously work with the Corps to, to do it. At the same time, of course, putting other projects online is very important um, in, in these estuary environments and moving forward with the C23, C24 projects, C44 and C43, everything that we can do to provide more storage treatment capacity and, and move these things forward is important. I appreciate the, the board being involved and engaged in having Colonel Booth and they become to really kind of help get a, a update and understanding as this moves forward now more rapidly as we approach LOSM. Um, you know, we, we're all engaged, we're all interested in picking the right horse, so to say, as we get down um, to, the, to the final wire here. But we wanna make sure that when we start this new schedule next November, that it's gonna be the right one. And it's gonna really benefit all, all the stakeholders and everybody around and getting the water right as we manage it and get through Florida. So everybody should stay engaged and should be vocal about you know their concerns and what's going on and i appreciate you listening and taking this in thanks thank you mr perry richard bedell you're recognized to speak uh good morning uh can you hear me now we hear you mr bedell thank you uh operator air on my end uh chair goss uh drew uh thank you for the opportunity to speak um, my name is Rich Budell. I'm up in Tallahassee. I'm representing the Florida Agribusiness Council. I too will also limit my remarks to the LOSUM uh, topic and specifically the water supply uh, issue uh, uh, associated with that. Uh, I want to certainly uh, support the comments from Mr. McVicker, uh, Mr. Barnett, uh, relative to our concern that uh, there is no longer a a band or, or whatever you call it, uh, an operational band above the water shortage band that gives deference to the water management district uh, on lake management issues. I appreciate uh, the comments from Mr. Wagner and Chair Goss and Mr. Butler uh, expressing a similar, uh, I think, issue. Um, and, and I'd like to pull that comment in general back to uh, existing uh, state statute uh, Section seven of chapter 373, specifically dealing uh, with, with an obligation that the district has to assure that there is adequate water to meet the needs of all current and future reasonable beneficial users and the natural system, and to avoid the adverse impacts associated with competition for water supplies. 
Uh, you do that through the permitting program and your water supply planning program. You've got a consent agenda later to uh, approve the Upper East Coast uh, Regional Water Supply Plan. That, that, that's the vehicle for you to identify future, current and future needs uh, for water supply. And, and you implement those through largely through your permitting program. And it, it's important to point out that every user in, in Florida, whether you're a utility, whether you're an industrial user, whether you're a recreational or an agricultural user, every user has a permit that's approved by your district. And in that permitting process, all of those that are successfully uh, uh, granted, uh, your district makes the determination that it is by definition a reasonable and beneficial use. And I, I think it's really important uh, to, to recognize that. While, while many of you think that the only reason that you're there is to stop discharges to the estuaries, that can be your policy, it can be your mission statement, it doesn't trump state law. And state law mandates that you meet the needs of current and future users. We believe that the elimination of a buffer zone above the water shortage zone significantly reduces your ability not only to manage allocation, but avoid competition. And I, I, I actually think having you know, been involved in the development of a lot of that legislation over my 30 plus year career in, in public service, you're actually introducing competition that the legislature specifically directs you to avoid. Um, I appreciate it very much. Thank you for your time. Uh, stay safe. Thank you, Mr. Bedell. Mr. Chairman, we have no additional raised hands for this item. Well, thanks very much, Rosie, and, and thank you all for taking the time to comment this morning. Uh, we're going to go to board member comment, and I was going to ask Ms. Meads uh, well, when she comes back. Uh, Mr. Bergeron, do you have any comments? I want to thank the Colonel for being here today and look forward to working uh, with the Corps on Losum and on Everglades restoration in general and, uh, and working to open up the bottom end of this system to move more water south and less water east and west. And um, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Bergeron. Mr. Olipich? Thank you very much, Chair Goss. Um, Losum has a tendency to take all of the air out of the room, so I'm going to try to fill it back up with some other things. I have about five things, and I'll try to make it relatively fast. Um, the triangle, which is something I've talked about for a long time, um, is really coming into its own, and uh, I just wanted everybody to know that if you want the updates, they're kind of buried in the back of our um, packet. And these are the updates of um, FDACs, FDEP, and South Florida Water Management District working together, as is also required in Florida statutes, for water quality in the NEEP, Lake Okeechobee, um, St. Lucie, and the Caloosahatchee. <clears throat> and I have to say that um, when we were in Okeechobee um, at the barbecue, I ran into Megan Jacoby who um, works for the South Florida Water Management District and is a very respected um, member. And she said to me that she was finding um, inspiration, basically, in this program that we are working on. And um, I, I, I keep thinking about that because if someone like her sees inspiration and the possibility for real uh, in, you know, improvement through communication and action, I believe it. And so I'm still, I still have my triangle right by my computer at home. I'm sorry we missed the Scotts Water Farm ribbon cutting. I was so excited about that. Um, we will uh, look forward to doing it um, again soon. And um, I also wanted to thank the city of Port St. Lucie for inviting me to be part of a ribbon cutting for um, an art program that they're doing called Waterways, which is, um, a, a, it's, it's federal and it moves around the country to kind of teach people about, also, a lot of it, most of it is really water supply and um, conservation, but also about um, the you know, estuaries in certain parts of the world. And they're um, partnering with um, Clyde Butcher, you know, who's just amazing. And his program is called Living Waters. 
And what I learned while I was there is this program is, um, these were pictures that he took and gave to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection about 20 years ago to um, shine the light on our aquatic preserves throughout the state. And these pictures are just beautiful. And um, if anybody has a chance to go see it in the city of Port St. Lucie, it's, it's really, really worth it. And um, I wanted to thank uh, FWC and Dr. Um, Tom for um, bringing a manatee back to um, Stewart to release it. It was very exciting. It was a beautiful manatee, and it had been rehabilitated at the Miami Aquarium. And um, I have to say that some of the little kids were saying, why are you releasing it here? There's not any seagrass, right? And we're kind of like, uh, you know, the manatee's strong. It can swim really far. It can go down to Lake Worth Lagoon where they have some seagrass, and we have a little bit in ours. But um, I, I know this isn't the place to discuss it, I know that uh, Mr. Bergeron has probably discussed certain things like this, but they are talking about possibly feeding the manatees in the northern part of the Indian River Lagoon because the situation is so dire. And the, the thing is, we created these warm spots. You know, we've already changed them. We've changed their migration patterns. And if they stay there to be warm, which is their number one goal, many of them will continue to starve to death this year. Um, I have one last thing, and I wanted to do it in public, because I knew if I did it on the side, some camera would probably catch me somewhere, and then I'd be like going to jail. So um, I, I, I spent some time with my mother, and we did decide that Ben is related to, um, yes, we, he is related to A.A. A. Buck Hendry who possibly um, might have some family connections from the 1800s. And uh, they uh, ended up uh, homesteading, I guess, on uh, 10 Mile Creek and Five Mile Creek, which is the upper areas of the uh, North Fork of the St. Lucie River. So um, Ben, we're, we might all be related. And so when we're no longer on this board, I'm going to have a dinner party and invite you to dinner with uh, the Hendrys of Martin County. It's just, it's just articles on family history, and I know she needs a copy of it. Okay. So um, thank you, everybody, and I look forward to the rest of the meeting, especially C25. Oh, thanks, Mr. Olives. Um, this means I'm going to ask for your comments, but before I do, do you have any abstentions for the record? That was my public comment. I have no abstentions, and I actually don't have anything to share today. Thank I mean, you. I can always share. I do want to share something. In Okeechobee, I told, I told Drew this. In Okeechobee, when I was listening to your lineage and your family, and I was so impressed, as everyone could, would be, and I, I want you to know that I, I'm a sixth generation or whatever, the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina, if you've ever seen The Last of the Mohicans, that's me, right, right up there on that cliff. And when I was listening to your amazing family, all I could think is about how my grandfather, the constable, at one point was just a great moonshiner. <laughs> that's all I've got. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Means. Vice Chair? <laughs> so I, I just wanted to restate, I think it's worth restating, the, um, um, what an example this whole LOSM process is about um, how government and stakeholders and citizens and tribes come together uh, to work on something collaboratively. Um, you know, it's been described as certain things are, are, you know, people are passionate about. I mean, quite frankly, I think it's, it's even more than that for a lot of people. You know, this is, this is about their livelihoods um, one way or another. And, um, you know, that's deeper than, that's deeper than passion in, in, in many ways because it's, it's just a critical element um, to their lives. And to have the federal government and the state government and everybody working with one another, um, at times everybody, you know, most of the time, everybody's not just totally happy, um, but they're but they're involved and they're being heard and things are transparent. And I think that's just, 
you know, really a wonderful example of how we can get things done. That being said, loathsome does tend to suck the oxygen out of the room, um, you know, in, 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 in an important way. Um, you know, people are really dialed into this, but I think one of the things that gets lost in, in, in some of these analysis uh, as you try to do the best you can under the circumstances for everybody involved is that you are not going to, it does not seem like it is even remotely possible to solve all these problems through LOSM. Um, the only way you solve these problems is through a continued investment in SERP. Uh, to get additional projects going and online and operational um, so that you can, you know, we talk about water supply, but then you talk about don't get the lake too high. Um, you know, those things are solved through storage projects, um, you know, that come online down the road uh, to the north of the lake, stuff to the south of the lake, abilities to put and clean water um, in areas other than simply using the lake to either hold or exit uh, exit the water and convey the water. So I think it's important to note, I mean, we've gone through, uh, we're gonna do something special, I think, today uh, with C25, but if you go back through our tenure on this board, um, either completing, uh, you know, having ribbon cuttings or, or ground breakings, it seems like it's a ground breaking, ground breaking, ribbon cutting, I mean, it, it you know, these things tend to, everybody laughs and smiles, we have a good time, but it, it, it's, it's, it's fantastic to see these things moving. Um, you know, it seems like we had ingredients in the, in the pantry for a long time, but there's no doubt we are cooking right now. And we got to continue to invest in these things. And, you know, the loathsome decision, it's a decision that will last, you know, several years, but it's not a decision that's, that goes, at, you know, infinitum. You're talking about hopefully at the next loathsome conversation, a lot more stuff online that you can put into your models that can make things look really, really good for, for everyone. And so I, I think uh, it's important to note that, you know, obviously it seems everybody's doing their best uh, to get loathsome as good as you can under the circumstances and with the tools you have to use now. Uh, but it, it seems like it's going to be really exciting to continue to invest in SERP and see what it looks like down the road. So thanks. Thanks, Vice Chair. Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, begin my comments today. Um, Jackie, thank you. That's neat. You're welcome. Um, I flipped through. There are a couple different, you know, a couple different old letters there. And uh, I look forward to sharing that with my grandfather. He's... Working on a book, and, and of course he's got the, he's got binders of the genealogy and, and all that stuff, and, and it's hard to find time just to sit down and review it with him. And it, this, I think this is going to be my excuse to go in and just sit down and talk to him. So thank you. Um, the uh, I'll say it one last time here. Uh, thank you to everybody that uh, helped to make the Okeechobee meeting a success. I feel it was a success, um, and um, uh, that was, uh, again, I'll say that was, that was awful special to me. But, uh, but that's my little selfish comment there, but, uh, but no, thank you again. Um, IFAS put together, a, uh, the Institute of Food Agricultural Sciences, UF, uh, put together an environmental lands management conference. And um, Rory Feeney, Mr. Collins, uh, myself, and Libby, attended it uh, a couple weeks ago. I did it up in Hernando County and um, had some had some folks from Swift Mud there, had folks from Lee County, folks from Polk County, uh, kind of a public management or public, you know, public management of, of environmental lands. And um, they went through several different, uh, had a lot of different topics, uh, preserving the natural resources. Uh, Betsy Bott from Archibald spoke at it, um, had, um, phosphorus and nitrogen budgets, soil health, stocking rates when dealing with cattle, and uh, forage management, and, and body condition scoring. Um, my sister-in-law was the one who actually taught the body condition scoring. But, um, um, and then they wrapped it up with a tour of uh, uh, some public lands there that uh, actually Pinellas County owns up there in the Hernando County area, Willfield, that uh, they use cattle to help maintain the land. 
um, but uh, but they use that use that primarily. Pinellas uses that for for water supply purposes all the way up in Hernando. But um, that was a good uh, good conference. I didn't get to stay for the entire tour. I did hear the bus broke down on Mr. Collins, Mr. Feeney, but uh, but sounded like sounded like they continued it on. But um, it was. Um, that was a great conference, and I appreciate appreciate them taking the time to, to attend it, and hopefully they got something out of it. Um, Veterans Day tomorrow. I'd be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to thank Colonel Booth, Lieutenant Colonel Polk, Miss Reynolds, Colonel Roman, and all the other veterans that we have here in attendance. Uh, thank you for your service. Um, really appreciate that. One final thing here, uh, sitting in on... Um, We've got local uh, legislative delegation meetings happening all over. Uh, Okeechobee Highlands Highlands was yesterday morning, Okeechobee yesterday afternoon. Um, I attended both of those, just kind of in listen-only mode. But um, uh, with, uh, with my state senator, Senator Albritton, and, um, and Representative Kaylee Tuck. But during that meeting, the governor dropped a press release. And it was announcement of DEP's announcement of water quality um, and Springs grants. And um, two big grants got awarded in the NEEP area. Um, septic to sewer and Treasure Island, right there in Okeechobee, top of the lake. Um, and then uh, the town of Lake Placid, um, which is uh, in the Swift Mud District, but also in the NEEP area. So um, those were two major, major award amounts. And uh, so that was great to see. And I appreciate the governor and DEP uh, making those happen. Um, so. Things are still happening on water quality. So uh, with that, that's what I had, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Mr. Butler. Uh, Colonel Roman? Uh, I have nothing at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Martinez? I have nothing at this time, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All right, I'll wrap up. Um, I, I want to associate myself with the remarks that the vice chair made uh, regarding the loathsome process. I absolutely agree with you. I think it's, it's government at its best, and I think the product is going to be better as a result, um, and I'm looking forward to it. And as you so succinctly said, it's, it's not the end. It's, it's part of the process, and it's, it's going to keep getting better as our projects come online. I'd like to thank our, our friends in uh, Okeechobee for their incredible hospitality last month. I, I've thought back on that night and um, day quite a bit. It was, it was really eye-opening and made some good new friends and, and learned a lot. So it was absolutely worthwhile. And, and Ben, thank you for your hospitality and your, your family for all being out there serving us lunch. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Commissioner Hurd for taking the time to come in this morning and to talk to us a little bit about the uh, IRL South um, and natural lands, the acquisition of 2,000 acres. That's something I'm hugely supportive of. I think that's that's a great step in the right direction, and uh, you know we're we're, get, we're getting all the land we need in that area, and it's it's really going to be a nice project when it's done, and it does help us on the ledger, which is something I'm always uh, reminded to uh, reminded to be aware of uh, constantly, right here. Um, and that's that's really all I have. So I think now we'll go on to um, on to consent, and let's see. We'll see. Are there any um, to do here. We have board members who want to move any items um, from consent to discussion. Mr. Chairman, this is Ben. Yes, Ben. Um, I'd like to pull agenda item number 26, just to have a little further discussion, potentially increasing the number of uh, contract awards, and uh, I'll offer a little further explanation later. Great. We will move uh, item 26 to discussion. Is there any, any other board member who would like to move any item? No, thanks. If there's anyone who would like to make a public comment, Rosie, you want to go ahead and call that? And let's hold off on 26. If someone wants to comment on 26, we'll wait till we have that discussion item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have one comment card for Mr. Dan DeLisi. Uh, well, I'll, I'll make this quick. Um, just wanted to call to your attention uh, the item on the uh, crew management plan. Um, don't know uh, how many of you are, are aware of crew. Um, I, like Chairman Goss, sat on the crew executive committee um, when I was on the district governing board. It's an amazing partnership between the district, 
Lee County uh, for land acquisition in the 60,000 acre watershed. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where if you ever just want to feel good about what you're doing at the district, read up on CRU. It's, um, uh, you know, similar to the IRL natural lands component, which we just talked about. Uh, it's natural restoration, preservation of natural lands and restoration of, of farmlands, uh, partnership with landowners, environmental groups, and, and government agencies. So. Again, thank you for everything you're doing with CREW, uh, continued management of the, the property, continued acquisitions, and, um, and again, um, it's a great project. Thank you, Mr. Delisi. Mr. Chairman, I do not have any more. Oh, I have one raised hand, though. Richard Weisskopf came in. Mr. Weisskopf, you're recognized to speak. You. Okay, can you hear me now? We hear you, Mr. Weisskopf. Hi. Uh, is, is this a time now for general public comment, or does it have to be on these specific issues that we've been listening to? We're at public comment on consent agenda items. So if you have a, a public comment on any of the consent agenda items, now's the time to speak. We do and have if it's on something else, do I then hold it off until the next round of public comments? Uh, yes, sir. What did I miss? Yes, sir. Okay, so I'll withdraw. That would withdraw be at number 34. When, what time will that be, do you think? I don't know, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Weisskopf. <laughs> okay. Thank you. When I, it's been interesting as a professor to listen to all what's been going on. So you should know that another one of your groupies is here watching you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Weisskopf. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Rosie. And, uh, Mr. Delisi, thank you for your comment. Um, if there's no further discussion by board members, could I have a motion to move items one or I'll make uh, um, hang on hang on a sec 14 to 25 be aware that items 14 and 15 on the consent agenda require a two-thirds majority vote and be aware that i'm going to be abstaining on 20. Uh, mr bergeron you make a motion okay, i'll make the motion thank you second i have a motion and a second any further discussion hearing none let's call that question mr bergeron yes uh, miss means yes mr olipich yes um, I vote yes, I'm standing on 20. Mr. Butler. Yes. All right, Vice Chair Wagner, I'm looking at you and saying yes. <laughs> uh, Colonel Roman. Yes. And Mr. Martinez. Yes. Thanks, that passes unanimously. We'll now go to uh, item number 26, which we move to discussion, and that's uh, surveying and mapping contracts, and I'll let Mr. Butler get this off. Mr. Chairman, if you would, um, I'll begin the discussion here. I coach my daughter's parliamentary procedure team for FFA. And one of the first things we teach them is you don't start discussion until you have a motion on the floor. So I'm going to go ahead and put a motion on the floor. I move that we adopt this resolution uh, with the authority to increase the number of contract awards to include a total of 18, the top 18 firms, ranked in order. I have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. This is Charlotte. I have a motion and a second. Let's proceed with the discussion. Mr. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, so um, when I looked down, um, I went ahead and I requested the, the scoring sheets. And I requested scoring sheets on all these items. Just to kind of look, just, just, just to understand what's going on. And when you look at these scoring sheets, and I think I saw that we had gotten an email that had the, the final column of all of the firms that received oral presentations. And when you look between nine, between eight and nine, and you go all the way down to 18. And when you look at the A, B, plus E scores and the C scores, C scores being the average or the, the total of the rankings, and A, B, and E being the total of the points, there is not much difference between those scores when you look at them, especially when you look at the A, B, plus E. And I think that sometimes the C, total, the C column gets skewed because of some ties in rankings, and so it, it, it kind of messes some things up. Um, if you look at that, I, I think that, um, and I've had the discussion with staff already, I think it is certainly comfortable that, um, uh, that 18 would be serviceable, um, and they feel like 18, there would be enough, there, there's enough survey mapping engineering things coming on with all the construction projects we have that the, the wealth is going to get spread there. Um, 
with that tight of a grouping, I, I just think it's I, I think it's imperative for us to go ahead and uh, make that down, take that uh, take the top 18 rather than make that cut off at 13. I see, I kind of see why. I, I can't see why that line got drawn at 13 when I look at these others. Uh, when you got a tie for the next for 14, 15, and 16, and then 17 is one point, and then you go down to 18, and the total point score is actually higher than the four above them. So uh, when I look at it, if you see the same thing, I, I see a definite line there at 18 and 19. Thanks, Mr. Butler. I did. Could you, for the public who doesn't have this, could you just exp run through what you just did with the numbers? I think that would be really helpful just to say what the numbers were at the, the old okay. cutoff point and what yeah. the new number is so that they're, what you're doing is basically inserting a natural cutoff point. Okay. Um, so if we, we begin there at uh, the firm that was ranked number eight, um, their total score from written and oral was 532. Their ranking total was 50. So we, that's, that's the beginning there, 532 and 50. Number nine, 526 and 53. Number 10, 528 and 55. Number 11, 521 and 56. Number 11, 508 and 56. Number 13, 524 and 60. Number 14, 526 and 61. Number 14, 505, 61. Number 14, 509, 61. Number 17, 515, 62. And number 18, 521 and 65. From there, number 19 is 492 and 82. Thank you. I'm sorry to make you go through that, but I think that explains exactly what you're, why you're doing what you're doing. Vice Chair Wagner, you have something? Uh, I just wanted to ask Alan. Alan, are you the correct presenter on this, Mr. Shirky? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so we made a, uh, initially we had 13, I think, that made the cut. Mr. Butler's made a, a comment. I think it's a, a well-taken one, which is there was a lot of bunching around that 13 that really is kind of an 18 if you all the scores and then there's a natural drop in between 18 and 19. I guess the question is from your perspective internally um, is 18 18 a good number for you guys? Yes sir we can work with 18 no problem if we were talking about jumping up to say 28 that might be a different story but to add that few to the <clears throat> list is just fine. Okay great thanks. Thanks Vice Chair. I had the same, Mr. Bertrand. I won't repeat what Mr. Butler said, but I had the same viewpoint when I'd seen that. So thank you for bringing it up, Mr. Butler. Thank you. I have a motion on the floor. I have a second. Is there any public comment on this, Rosie? No, Mr. Chairman. Is there further board comment? Hearing none, I'm going to call that question. Ms. Bergeron? Yes. Ms. Meads? Yes. Mr. Olipich? Yes. I'm going to vote yes. Vice Chair Wagner? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Uh, Colonel Roman? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Thanks. That passes unanimously. Thanks, Mr. Butler, for bringing that to our attention. We're going to go on to uh, technical reports, and we've got uh, Sue Lynn Kirkland, who's sitting in for Mr. Mitnick today for the water conditions report. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me fill in for Mr. Mitnick this morning, who couldn't be here. I'm happy for the opportunity, and I will again try to live up to Mr. Mitnick's thoroughness. This first slide looks back at monthly rainfall over the past year and a half, but I will focus on the period starting May 2021. The wet season got, to, got off to a late start on May 28th, which is in part which in part contributed to May 2021 being the sixth driest May in the period of record. However, once it started, we had a fairly well-behaved wet season. You can see here that we had uh, minor deficits in June, August, and October, and had minor surpluses in July and September. So far for the partial month of November, uh, rain to date is, has already surpassed average monthly rainfall, even without more rain. However, we do not expect this trend to continue at quite this rate. October district-wide rainfall 
was 3.55 inches, and that's the plot on the left-hand side. This is 86% of normal, with a deficit of just over half an inch. For the wet season, the plot on the right-hand side of the, su of the slide started May 28th and ended on October 17th. The district-wide rainfall was 33.68 inches, which is 99% of average, which it, with a deficit of only about a quarter of an inch. As you can see here, the wet season deficit deviations from normal are the Upper Kissimmee at 89% of normal and Eastern Miami-Dade at 88% of normal. Moving to system conditions, I will start in the north. Looking at the upper chain of lakes, all of the smaller lakes are at or near their respective schedules. They are not shown on this map. The larger lakes, East Lake Toho and Lake Toho, are about 0.4 feet below their respective regulation schedules. And last week's rain helped to nudge them a little more towards their winter pool regulation schedule. As you can see here on the lower left, Lake Kissimmee is well below its, its regulation schedule. As Mr. Mitnick mentioned last month, the challenge is getting the chain of lakes to their respective regulation schedules at this time of the year, particularly with the below normal rainfall for the area. Also, as Mr. Mitnick mentioned last, last month, we have been considering operations for the lakes along with the desire to maintain flows down the river for the health of the river and the restoration that has taken place along the Kissimmee River. With this in mind, discharges are being reduced in accordance with a discharge ramp down rate favorable to the river in coordination with the Kissimmee River scientists. And I believe Mr. Glenn may touch on this a little bit more. Moving a little farther south to Lake Okeechobee, we will look at the monthly dynamic position analysis. As, as you've seen before, the purple shaded region represents approximately a 50% chance that the stage will fall within this zone as we move forward in time. Through most of this, this upcoming dry season, stage will fall predominantly within the LORS 2008 low subband. And as we move through the dry season, this is a reasonable likelihood of what to expect. This morning, the lake stage is 15.99 feet, which includes an increase of 0.15 feet as a result of last week's rainfall. Next, we will review the potential for releases to the estuaries, starting with the Caloosahatchee. And remember, this is a model prediction if we do everything exactly the way the model calls for. Releases less than 2100 CFS are represented by the gray zone. Above 2100 CFS is the orange color shown in here, and it's the difference between the top of the gray and the top of the orange. And the blue represents this, that stage is likely to stay above the base flow zone. And when I say CFS, I mean cubic feet per second. Similar story for St. Lucie. Again, this is a model project projection, what you would get if you followed the model exactly the same as the input and release assumptions. Here, the orange color represents flows greater than 200 cubic feet per second. Now let's move to the so southern portion of the system and the central Everglades. Area 1 is slightly above the top of regulation schedule with the S10 structures closed. Area 2 is above schedule and the S11s are open. Prior to last week's rain, you can see here that stage was receding approximately parallel to schedule. Last week's rain resulted in a small increase in stage but is now receding again. The operational intent for Area 2 is to continue a recession approximately parallel to the schedule. Over here on the left, area three is very near schedule, and we continue to discharge in accordance with the Tamiami Trail flow formula, which releases water from area three into Everglades National Park through the S33 structures into the L29 Canal and Northeast Shark River Slough, and also through the 12 C and D structures. 
just a little bit farther west. Next, let's, let's move, let's, sorry. Next, let's look at how water has been moving around the system since the beginning of May. Inflows to Lake Okeechobee have been about 1,178,000 acre feet. To the east coast, just under 45,000 acre feet since the beginning of May, with no releases from Lake Okeechobee. As previously reported with Lake Okeechobee stage above 14 feet, the operations of the C-44 basin are such that basin runoff is directed through the S-80 structure toward the St. Lucie estuary, which is why this number has been increasing. Looking at the other canals, the C-23 and C-24 combined contributed roughly 187,000 acre feet, and a little farther north, the C-25 canal discharge about 84,000 acre feet to the Indian River Lagoon. Moving a little bit farther south to the Lake Worth Lagoon, there have been zero discharges from the lake to the Lake Worth Lagoon. Over on the west coast, just over 885,000 acre feet to the Caloosahatchee Estuary, and that's a combination of both basin runoff and Lake Okeechobee water, with Lake Okeechobee contributing roughly 14% of the water moved to the estuary. A little bit farther south, again, inflows to Lake Okeechobee of about 1,178,000 acre feet, with total outflows of 435,000 acre feet, or about one third of the inflows. Total flows into the water conservation areas are about 840,000 acre feet since the beginning of May, and includes flows from the stormwater treatment areas, as well as direct inflows from the east and the west. That water makes its way through the system down through the central Everglades. Since May 1st, about 670,000 acre feet has been delivered to the park. Of that 767,000, about 475,000 here at the north through the S33 and the, S3 and the S12 structures. The remaining 292,000 acre feet farther south through the detention cells along the eastern boundary of Everglades National Park. Next, we will look at the stormwater treatment area flows. So far for water year 2022, which started in May of 2021, the stormwater treatment areas have had flows of nearly 950,000 acre feet that they have been treating and moving through the system. Moving on to groundwater, Groundwater monitoring sites continue to be a mixed bag along both the east and the west coast. The green, blue, and black dots indicate normal to above normal. The orange and red dots indicate below normal. These colors provide an indication of current water levels in comparison with historical water levels for this time of the year and does not necessarily indicate an issue, but is something we continue to monitor and keep an eye on. Looking at the potential forecast for the coming months, we are looking at a La Nina year. The Climate Prediction Center is showing slightly below rainfall for the month of November, increased chances of below normal rainfall for the three month windows of November to January and February to April, and then back to equal chances of above normal, normal or below normal rainfall for the three month window from March to May. For my final slide, we will look a little shorter term at the forecast for the next week. Day one was actually yesterday and was for light rain along the east northeast coast. Day two is today with only slightly more rain expected compared with yesterday. But then moisture moves up from the south ahead of a front on Thursday and Friday, which pushes through, the, through our area Friday night and Saturday and then is followed by a couple of drier days. Another front is expected next week, but neither of these two fronts are expected to produce anywhere near the widespread soaking from last week's rainfall. I will end with good news. The tropics are quiet with nothing expected in the next two weeks. 
and the hurricane season is now winding down for the year. And that's all I have, so I will end and ask if there's any questions. That is good news. Uh, thanks, Ms. Kirkland. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Olipich. Ms. Kirkland, thank you so much for your presentation. You're welcome. I find your voice very soothing. <laughs> thank you. Can you please go back to page 10, I think it is? Thank you. Yeah, that, the one with the blue and uh, orange. I'm sorry, maybe 11. Thank you. So this chart, um, the, the pattern, that's, the, that's when water is being sent uh, from, Lake, from Lake Okeechobee through the stormwater treatment areas, right? The um, yellow or goldish color is um, water from Lake Okeechobee. The blue is basin runoff, and yes, it is to the storm stormwater treatment areas. Okay, and so, the the has the didn't the dry season start last month? October seventeenth. So does this mean we haven't sent any water south during the dry season yet? Uh, not yet, not yet. How come? In part because of the rainfall that we've been receiving, and we are still are recovering from some of the runoff that we've had, and also as we exit the wet season and enter into the early part of the dry season, generally that's the time when we would be looking to give the stormwater treatment areas a break, a little bit of a okay. reprieve, and kind of help improve their health. The other thing that we need to look at is the state of the stormwater treatment areas, uh, the construction and rehabilitation that's ongoing, and that work that's continuing, as well as the health of the vegetation, which I believe Mr. Glenn uh, may cover a little bit more as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Meads. Why, why, Drew, why don't we measure rainfall in the Keys? Do you, if you put out the, met, met, you know, right, we do this over and over again, we never talk about the rainfall down in the Keys and down on the bay here, there, and the other, but I don't think we measure, do we? Is there a reason to measure the Keys? And, I mean, it's just weird, it's like the only camp, it's always like that, right? You know that's what I tell you all the time. It's always like that. Nobody. Cheryl, I, I think our gauges aren't big enough. Uh, so, listen, put out gauges and I'll ride around and check them. I'm so, joking. I just want to know, is there reason or what is the rationale for never having numbers for, for rain in our? I mean, we can put that in. I do, I do believe we have gauges in the keys. Yeah, so we have gauges in the keys and I, you know, it's some... I think rainfall is one of the more critical components to the salinity of Florida Bay as well. So I, I, that is something that we have. Yeah. I just be, be not, you know, the question is why, why are we choosing not to report the numbers of one area when we report everybody else? Is it because it doesn't matter or is it just because we just haven't in the past? I, and I think we are we going to in the future. I don't know. I'm not trying to be difficult. I think we could certainly look into putting that on the maps, um, checking with our, the gauges that we do, the rainfall gauges that we do have available, and, and the coverage. Are those automatic? Do they just send you numbers? Okay. Yeah. Good. So, I, it, you know, I mean, we've got so, so much data everywhere, and no one's asked us to do that yet, but now you have asked us to do it, <laughs> and so and, we can do and that. That may in part be because we don't have operational structures that we operate. Down in, down in the Keys. So that and may you don't. be why it hasn't Yeah, and I'm up never before. beaten up on you because you're lovely and you don't deserve <laughs> it. But here's the way it is. We pay the same taxes oh, that the rest I, of you do. We don't get a break. <laughs> we don't get a break because we don't have a canal. Understood. We don't get a break because we don't have a pump station. So, you know, do me a solid and report that. You know, I just it just feels weird, right? We're the only ones. Oh, no. She's oh, no, you're not. We're not, we're not going there, I know. <laughs> Lee County won't say a word. We get our rain gauge. <laughs> oh, sorry. I have one comment, uh, Mr. Bergeron. Uh, I noticed in area two where for the last three or four months we've been about a foot above schedule and you had mentioned the S11s were, were open, uh, but I've seen the volume kind of reduce uh, on the S11s, and I think the time frame, the duration time frame of that water being a foot above schedule and, and 2A, mm -hmm. you, 
uh, should look at and maybe start moving that water south. Yeah, I do know from discussions with the Corps, the intent is to be receding uh, approximately parallel to schedule. Mm -hmm. And the rainfall last weekend did bump us up a little bit. Uh, it, we do appear to be having a fairly decent recession since that rainfall. And the intent would be to continue to monitor that and make further adjustments to recede about parallel to, to schedule. Mr. Okay. I think that's a good idea. Thank you. Mr. Butler. Just one, um, and maybe Sue Lynn, maybe more for Lawrence, um, whenever you get to your presentation, can you talk a little bit about Lake Kissimmee and just, I mean, I, when we talk about deviation from regulation schedule, can you kind of address that and, and, you know, what ecologically, if there are any issues that we may see or something like that, can you, can you talk about that in yours? Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Glenn, come up and give the ecological conditions report. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, looking at this picture on the front is what restoration can look like. This is the Kissimmee River in the phase one area. And what you don't see is a C-38 canal going down the center. Instead, you see a, a free-flowing river that is going in between its floodplain, which is a mile to two miles wide. Uh, it's just a, a great success story for what we're doing here in our partnership with the Army Corps in the state and in restoration in, in South Florida. I'm uh, sorry, looking at Mr. The Glenn, going back to that picture, if you don't yes. mind. Well, it, that is an awesome picture. I didn't see the, see the forest on either side, so that's like when you're with them and they go, see over there? That's the edge. <laughs> so there it is from above. It, it, does this have where we were for the ribbon cutting? Uh, we are a little north of where we were for north. the ribbon cutting. Thank you. That's, you're that's quite a welcome. great photograph. Um, looking at the Kissimmee and where we are, uh, Sue Lynn talked about decreasing discharges, and Mr. Butler, I'll get to that point of, of how S65 at the bottom of Lake Kissimmee really dictates what happens here. But you see at about 1,400 CFS is when the, the floodplain is pretty much inundated um, oak line to oak line, which you saw in that previous picture. Now as we're bringing uh, discharge down in order to save water to be able to provide a minimum flow to the river through the winter, uh, because of where Lake Stage is in Lake in Kissimmee, Cypress, and Hatchnaha, we're, we're discharging and we're, we're ramping down, and so you're starting to see things dry out a little bit as compared to where we were last month. Um, so here's where we are, and here is the the stage or the um, the uh, oh my gosh <laughs> the uh, schedule. Sorry, I could not find that word for S65 and and you see this, this water that's coming down and, and we're bringing this flow is what goes, gives us a stage of about 1400 that has this protracted floodplain inundation. And that's really the relationship we have between Lakes Kissimmee, Cypress, and Hatchnaha and changing that regulation schedule to hold more water so we can have a volume of water to provide to the river through the, the a protracted you know, wet season it fills up and then and have that, in, that recession slower and not have to, like now we're having to hit the brakes because we don't have the water. But we don't have the water from a, a couple of different reasons. One, climate didn't provide us the water. And then if you see this part of the schedule right here in S65, all of the schedules in the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes drive those lakes down to a low pool stage before the wet season so that you have storage to fill it back up during the dry season. Well, when we change this regulation schedule, and here's where S65 is, here's where the river is, and it controls Lakes Kissimmee, Cypress, and Hatchnaha. So what we do is we're going to get rid of this. We don't have to artificially drive the, the river, I mean the lakes down, and it provides 100,000 acre feet of additional storage that we can then provide to the river. We haven't implemented this schedule yet, so if we go back and we look at, you know, we could have not come down here, we could have been up here, and we could have had a, a gradual recession happening. But because this lake schedule is still in place, um, that's, that's how we're operating. 
And I, I hope that was helpful. Um, one of the great things that we're seeing, though, with that uh, we get cooler weather, and uh, we do have the flow going, that we have uh, ameliorated this low dissolved oxygen condition. We're back up to almost five, which is fantastic. Uh, so fish and other critters requiring oxygen in the water are very happy. Um, moving on to Lake Okeechobee, uh, this is a, a new slide for y'all, um, and it shows where the inputs are coming from, uh, mostly from the Kissimmee River and from the Indian uh, Prairie are coming into the lake. We have about 1,500 going out in ET. We have 4,000 coming in with uh, rainfall. So you've heard it said before that the lake is easier to fill up than it is to move water out of. So that's where we are currently um, with a lake at about 16 feet. So 16 feet is where we are. That puts us about a half a foot up above the ecological envelope. Um, but we still have two months until we start that recession. So we're, we were you know, hoping to get some water out of the lake before this rain came and chart caused this, uh, this uh, reversal. But uh, we would like to be able to get back into this ecological envelope and, as you saw in the position analysis, hopefully get down to that 12 and a half to 12 foot range where SAV can recover. We are pretty much at the end of the algae bloom season, which is a great thing. So you remember in, in July and earlier on, even in April, we had some pretty big bloom conditions that's waxed and waned through the summer. But here we are at the end, cooler temperatures, uh, day length has decreased. Um, a lot of the, the nutrient that was in, that was brought in by those rains has been used up. So we're seeing a, a lot lesser bloom potential on the lake. And this is a pretty interesting contrast of where we were last year to this year. So we're, we're poised very well as we, we leave this blue-green algae season. Um, looking at, uh, at some of the neat information that we can get from our increased monitoring, where we have 32 stations that we monitor biweekly during algae, algae season, we see in this, this last biweekly sample, um, we're continuing that trend from dominance by microcystis to mixed communities, and, and that has declined even more from 38% to 22% of being dominated by microcystis. So that's a good, microcystis, that's a good news story. Um, along with that, uh, toxin concentrations, if you see these warmer colors, this is when you get uh, to eight and above. And here in this last sample, we're not seeing any concentrations that are above that. Um, even though we don't have a lot of uh, bloom potential here, there were a couple of hot spots where we did exceed the 40 milligrams per liter, which we say is a bloom condition. But as you saw in those previous slides, it wasn't uh, microcystis by itself, and they weren't producing toxins, so that's good news. Uh, wrapping up snail kite nesting for the year. Um, in total, uh, we had a, a pretty decent year for snail kite nesting. Um, we had a good number nesting on the lake, and so the, they're not the most successful birds that nest, but they had a, a really good uh, go at it this year, so that's putting more birds into the population. Uh, looking over at the St. Lucie, you see that currently there's 614 CFS from this last week with zero coming from the lake. Uh, we've talked about the, the basins that contribute, and you're seeing here that uh, tidal basin is, is putting a lot of water into that estuary currently, and how that impacts uh, salinity regimes as we go through is that as we've decreased off of this peak here, uh, here's fresh water and coming into more brackish that the, the salt water salinity is, is able to go back up in the forks and the salinity condition is in the good middle of the good range for adult oysters. Uh, looking at the Calusa Hatchie, uh, a similar sort of thing where we've had some pretty big pulses coming in. Currently we have about 3,000 CFS coming out of S79. Uh, and a lot of that, the major majority, is from this very large uh, C43 basin, and or it's actually back here, um, right up here. 
And what we're seeing is this uh, salinity regime come back to what we see more uh, as we move into the dry season, where the fresh water that is pushed down is starting to retreat back. Usually this zero to five range is somewhere between S79 and Fort Myers. So we're getting that condition that looks more like how it does during the winter time. And we're seeing that these salinities are within the good range for adult oysters in Cape Coral, Shell Point, and Sanibel. Uh, moving on to the stormwater treatment areas. Currently, to, year in this, to date in this water year, we have 887,000 acre feet of water that have been processed by the stormwater treatment areas with 61,000 acre feet or 7% of that total coming from Lake Okeechobee. Uh, before this last rain event, we were, we were closer to this uh, level, the normal target. We're a little elevated currently as those STAs are, are dealing with the runoff from that pretty large rain event that we did have. Now, as we go down through each STA and look at what's going on uh, within each of them, um, within STA1, here's cell seven. That's where we're still working on some grade and fill. I had pictures of that, I believe, last month. Uh, this is an area, this one has been um, already completed. This is cell five. So this flow A is currently offline or, or online with restrictions on how we push water through. But this flow A over here, the eastern flow A, is performing exceedingly well. Um, it is at about 11 right now, and that it's a really good concentration coming out of STA 1 East. Uh, looking at 1 West, there's still a lot of refurbishment that's going on in here. We're taking out this dog leg. There's uh, construction going on down here for the uh, pump station for that, that new part, uh, the expanded part of the STA. But we're still seeing within this area, there's still some highly stressed vegetation in here. And so we have crews in there that are working on that. Going down into two, this is where the lake is being filled. <laughs> There's a lot of earthwork coming in here to get the topography correct. Um, but in talking with the STA group uh, this week in preparation for this, they said that flowway one, flowway uh, four, five are all putting out about 10 to 11 ppb of phosphorus, and that's just behaving fantastically. They said that flow A3 is a little high, it's at 20, but that's still, that is fantastic. So it's showing when we do work in here and, and we take that extra time to get it right that the concentrations that are coming out are just wonderful. Uh, moving into 3-4, this is the cell that was dried down completely because of tussocks, so it's, uh, it's offline. Uh, the STA as a whole, without this large cell being online, is putting out between about 14 and 15 parts per billion. And then STA 5-6, uh, the southern portion or cells or flowways of here are the parts that dry out. So we're having a little issue there with um, submerged aquatic vegetation in the cells where we need it. Uh, I said it's been taken over by emergence. And so when we can get the C-139 uh, FEB put in place and have a more, uh, you know, a better ability to keep this SGA hydrated, we won't have that issue as much. But they said that flow A1 especially is performing exceptionally well and, and near Q-Bell levels. So it's just saying that this refurbishment that we're doing, restoration strategies that's going on, are, are putting the effort towards these amazing systems that can do a wonderful job of, of removing phosphorus when they're tip top. Uh, coming down into Biscayne Bay, with all these releases here, you see when we have releases coming into the bay that uh, salinity comes down. We don't want this to be a seawater system. It's more of an estuary and bay, so we're, we're getting into those levels that are, are good for Biscayne Bay. Then coming down into the depth map. Can you go back the, to that last chart? Certainly, sir. How do you tell whether this is good or bad? We, I had a line on there at one point, and I took the line off. You had asked for it. <laughs> so, yes, you, you got me on that one for sure. <laughs> Where is that line? 
That, we had that line in between about 30 and 35, because this is seawater and, and the, the concentration of seawater. And you know, if you're down here in the 25s, if you're estuarine, this is kind of where you want to be. So it really depends on where you are in location to this edge and then being closer to the bay. So it's kind of hard to put a, a line, but for these closer ones, yes, we would like that level to be closer between, you know, in the 20s and below, and depending on the time of year. You're welcome, sir. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. The, the urban boundary district push that we were talking about earlier, is it, would it be located anywhere on this map to the left? I was just curious to see. I don't remember how close it is to the bay. I don't think it's on that map. It's like the western, it's the western edge, I think, right, right on the border of Everglades National Park. And well, there's the one by Homestead Air Force Base as well. Which one are you talking about? Do you know? I'm talking about the one by the Air Force Base. Yeah. Where's the Air Force Base? Is it on the map? Kind of where that red dot is, I think. Yeah, and please don't, I'm not trying to waste your time. It, this is really important. Oh, this is really important. Oof, I can't. It's, okay. it's like 22 or 20. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Your next. Uh, coming down and looking at the water depth assessment tool that looks across the Everglades, uh, one of the, the great things to note is we were starting to dry out at last month's meeting in the, in the northeastern section of 3A, and that, as we go into the dry season, is problematic from a, do we lose peat? Do we lose it through fire? Do we lose it through it just drying and, and oxidizing and blowing away? And these rains did a really good job of, of adding some water back to the Everglades. We were... I have a slide in a second that's going to, I'll spoil her. You know, we, we've moved kind of from a little dry to almost average, which is, which is a good thing. And as, uh, as Mr. Bergeron was asking about Water Conservation Area 2, um, I had, it has a really large topographic difference between the northern part and the southern part. So if we are trying to keep this part hydrated. This part stays a little bit wet. But let me go through this slide, and I'll go through, and I'll, I'll tell you why we would like to hold a little water in here a little bit longer. But what we are seeing currently is we see that the sloughs all have connectivity, so Shark River Slough, Taylor Slough, even the sloughs over to the coastal areas as we go into the dry season is a really good thing. Now, here is... Water Conservation Area 2, Water Conservation Area 3. This red star is the Alley North colony, and that's the largest white ibis colony in the Everglades. Uh, on a good year, it puts out about 30,000 ibis nests, so it's very important to that community. Um, there's a gauge next to it, which is this gauge over here, and this is a position analysis for what that gauge is doing. Uh, the scientists like to, at about September 15th, be up here at about 11.5 so that we have a recession down to about 9.5 at March 15th because they have found that if we are at 9.5 at March 15th, this colony is very successful. If we are below that, success drops off very rapidly. So here we are over at Water Conservation Area 2, and these are the, the S11s are located uh, in this Oh, no, sorry, in this levee. And the thought is, is that the best use of this water, although there will be some harm to this part of Water Conservation Area 2, that to, we requested that the, this, these discharges be reduced to save water to provide as long as we can to keep this part hydrated. So yes, it is a trade-off. It is a trade-off, and, and Water Conservation Area 2 is probably the most degraded of the areas. Um, just through time, it, it has taken a large hit. There's not, no longer really tree islands in this area, and uh, Dr. Fred Sklar's group is looking at what is the appropriate hydrology for this area, and then are there tools we have in our toolbox to create some sort of habitat heterogeneity in here, or, or having a mosaic of different habitats that can be useful, again, to wildlife. So right now, the thought is, can we hold a little extra water in here 
to, to keep this colony uh, you know, intact when it gets to that time of year. Uh, coming down to the tree island map, currently of the 371 tree islands that we have mapped here, 167 of them are inundated. Um, that gets us back to the long-term average, about 47, 45 to 47. Last week we were, or last month we were a lot lower than this. Um, so this is where I'm saying that we've, this rainfall event took us from a little bit dry to about average. And just to have in contrast, in 2017, really wet year, you had 330 islands here, and we were talking about tree island health at that point. So this is the, a, a good normal, if you want to say normal, <laughs> average condition for tree islands in the Everglades this year. Tree islands, wildlife, plant communities, we've been within an inch up or down through the whole rainy season. So it's, We've uh, talked about Mother Nature being really good to us this yeah, year, <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. and some great water management as well. The rain god has worked with us. Yes, sir. Now, this last slide, looking at Taylor Slough stages and Florida-based salinities, uh, this rain again has helped us here. Uh, last month I came and said, you know, hey, we had a really, a really good year where we were exceedingly low, and that came from the, all of that rain that we had that we brought down. We had you know, 1.6 million acre feet go down through the, the Everglades and, and down into Florida Bay, and so that, that's a lot, and it drove these salinity levels down. And we kind of rode that, and then we got to a point where we weren't having rains, and so we were kind of coming out of that. Um, but where we are now is within the eastern bay, so this part of the bay is within that interquartile range, which we like to be. The central is, is still a little high, and the western has gotten back into that range as well. Um, I wanted to, to talk about something that, that I've mentioned up here before, and I've said, you know, people ask, Florida Bay, is it a, a purely rain-driven system? And in talking with the scientists this, this week, we had some really good discussion. They said, you know, it is rain-driven, but it does have an operational component as well. And what she was saying, and this was Mandy McDonald, she's one of our just premier scientists in Fred's group, she says this area and this land in here is like a sponge. And if we get a really good rainfall, you know, in the wet season, and we fill up that sponge, then think about a sponge, if you have, if you're putting more water on it, it can continue to move past it. So we fill up this sponge, we can actually get that overland flow into the bay. If we've been dry, it has to fill back up first. And so this is where she says, with operations alone, with the volumes of water that we typically have now before we finish SERP, that we spend all that time trying to fill the sponge. But when we have those rain years where we have a lot of water and we fill that sponge up, then we can get that connectivity down into Florida Bay. So I wanted to kind of clear that up where, I, where I've talked about rainfall. Rainfall, it's only rainfall. It is rainfall in operations, but rainfall helps to get that, that sponge filled first, and then it allows operations to continue water across that landscape and into the bay. So with that, I will thank you very much and take any questions you might have. So okay. it's driven by rainfall as well as operations. the million five hundred thousand acre feet in an average rain year of water flow correct correct in the river of grass kind of a combination exactly yeah thank you Lawrence. That, that sponge analogy is very helpful i think it probably changes a lot of our thinking on sort of how we <laughs> get, get water down there mr Olipich. first of all those are the cutest ducks i've ever seen <laughs> i never saw those before really cute um, on the St. Lucie slide, um, when will the district start reporting seagrass again? Will it be next summer? It, it's just hard to keep track of. Sure. We, uh, so we do our evaluations or our monitoring through the, the growing season. So that is coming to an end now. So as soon as our scientists analyze that data for this past year, I can bring that to you. Okay. That's great. And then the algae slide, I mean, that's really the, the contrast of the two years. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, can we hope yeah, we've, reasonably we've, for that again next year? If, if you recall, we had a much earlier large-scale bloom this year 
that covered almost the entire lake. And we've talked about the amount of dissolved inorganic nitrogen that that, that bloom likely consumed. Um, there's a lot of different factors, and I, I can't attribute it just to saying, oh, the unwrapped candy was eaten. <laughs> you know? But it's just how that occurred, how rainfall occurred. Um, you know, that, that's a, a first at the podium explanation. But what we're doing with all of this extra data that we've been collecting, and we have a, a fantastic science, scientist here, Dr. Anna Washnika. Um, she is going to be taking the data that we have collected with this expanded monitoring and try to look at what are the, the correlations in that data, what, what jumps out at us, what, what causes, what's happening when blooms are occurring, what happens when we see uh, blooms not occurring. So that's something that, you know, everybody's interested in, the, the Blue Green Algae Task Force is interested in, and how do we get to our better understanding of, of how blue green algae blooms are working on the lake. Thank you. Yeah, it's, that was really unusual. Just as someone who had flown over with my husband all those years, and it was always around June, July, when it was the high point. And this year it was more towards, what would you say? It was April, May. April. Yeah, thank you. And my last question was about that STA slide. Yes, ma'am. If you don't mind going back to that sure slide. I, I thought that we should breach this because it's important and it's, um, it's, it's a high intense um, area of discussion. So um, when I had had my briefing, the percentage wasn't in here. And I said, why isn't the percentage in there? The percentage has been in there, we really need the percentage. And the scientists have told me, you know, Jackie, that's a slippery slope with that percentage because it's not as easy as just putting the number up there. So I appreciate y'all putting the number up there, but can you just in human terms talk to me, why is it hard? Yeah, and, this, and Drew, you might have a better grasp on this, but what? I think I want people to know it's hard. I want, I <laughs> want us to, because that's how we can all learn about it. Where, where we've been in, in STAs, and remember the STAs when they were originally created was looking at a, a goal of 50 parts per billion and not the Q-bell that we are now. And there's some language in there about what percentage of water would come from the lake or from different basins and, and would we could handle and how we we crafted and created these, the size of the STAs in order to meet the need for reducing runoff first. You know, taking the runoff from the, the EAA was the purpose of the STAs, and then we back calculated after we have taken those volumes, what can we take from the lake? So that changed once we went from 50 to Cubell of 13 on, on average and 19 in a single year. And so we've gone through restoration strategies to expand some of these STAs to make them larger, to create the FEB so that we can deliver water in a different way. So that, that back calculation you know, probably has a, a, a smaller volume from the lake currently. So you know, in, in how that was constructed and how we look at it, there's a couple of points of, of contention in there of, of what are they designed to take from the lake. And you know, my, my first answer would be is they are created to treat runoff first. And then when, depending on where rain falls in the landscape over what period of time, what capacity do we have to treat lake water you know, after we've done the, the primary job of, of right. the other. I really appreciate that frank discussion, and all together, I hope we can continue to work on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Does anyone else have anything for Mr. Glenn? If not, we're going to go ahead and break for lunch. We'll uh, reconvene around 1.30. We'll uh, go ahead and resume the meeting. Calls back to order. And we'll move on to discussion on agenda item number 30, which is the Alternative Water Supply Funding Program, and uh, Ms. Adams. Good afternoon. My name is Stacy Adams. I'm a lead project manager with the Water Supply Bureau, and today I'm going to be giving an update on the AWS program and the FY23 application process. This is for information purposes only. However, we uh, are 
welcome to any input the board may have on the 23 process. So in 2019, Governor DeSantis signed an executive order requesting recurring funding for alternative water supply development projects. And the governor and the legislature recognized the importance of those projects in the protection of Florida's natural systems and allocated $40 million during the past three legislative sessions. For FY22, the board approved the list in May of this year, and those projects were forwarded to DEP for funding allocations. We have not received word back on those projects yet. So in anticipation of our proposed schedule, we're anticipating to release an application on, on December 1st. Uh, we'll conduct two informational Zoom webinars in January. Um, we're gonna close the application on February 28th. In March and April, staff will go through the internal review process. And in May, I will come back to the board with a presentation of the project list that would be forwarded to DEP. So there are two project types that are eligible for funding consideration. The first is alternative water supply projects, which, is, which are projects that increase water supplies through the development of non-traditional water sources to meet current and, exist and future needs. Um, previously funded projects include reclaimed water plants and transmission main expansions, uh, reverse osmosis plants, brackish water supply wells, and aquifer storage and recovery projects. The second type is water conservation, and those are projects that use water, hardware, or technology to increase their water use efficiency. Previously funded projects have included high efficiency indoor plumbing retrofits or rebates, automatic line flushing devices, and irrigation retrofits that include soil moisture sensors, rain sensors, and irrigation head upgrades. The district does encourage industrial, commercial, and institutional, as well as agricultural water users and homeowner and condo associations to apply for funding. So the district has been providing cost share for over two decades. For alternative water supply, the program was developed in 1997 and conservation was established in 2003. AWS has provided approximately $236 million for 522 projects that creates 515 million gallons per day of capacity that equates to a combined public water use for Broward and Palm Beach counties. For water conservation, we've provided approximately 8.3 million for 238 projects with an estimated water savings of 12.9 million gallons per day. And that is slightly less than the city of Cape Coral's public water supply use. So of these amounts, the district has provided approximately 23 million for 43 AWS and water conservation projects over the past two years. So as part of the DEP guidance document for all the districts, we're required to provide a prioritized list by May of every year. So they've asked us to consider some items. They'd be providing re regional benefits. Uh, it should support a MFL water body if applicable. Projects should be ready to go. Um, with, that means permits in hand, con contracts on staff, so that they can move forward. And every project should have undergone a cost benefit analysis. So in addition to the DEP considerations, the district has additional AWS considerations. We want projects to support or be consistent with a regional water supply plan. Reducing dependence on traditional sources, it has to support ocean outfall legislation if appropriate and contribute to AWS development in resource limited areas. For water conservation projects, we looked at the water source that's being conserved, the quantity that's being saved, and the cost effectiveness of those projects. So historically the program, the governing board priorities have considered that applicants must be within the district boundaries or provide benefits to our district. It should be AWS or water conservation we only fund construction or implementation cost. We do not fund O&M, design, engineering, permits, et cetera, or pilot projects. Um, these projects should support the mission of the district and or an approved plan. We prioritize projects based on resource areas such as a restricted allocation area. So you'll see that the, we have the last item which is in yellow. Um, for over a decade, the district has been encouraging water conservation through our year-round irrigation rule. 
And as you may recall, during last November's meeting, the board approved including the irrigation ordinance status as an eligibility requirement beginning in fiscal year 23. For FY22, any local government or municipality who had an existing irrigation ordinance that comported with the district's year-round irrigation rule received bonus points during the review process. No one was excluded from funding consideration during FY22. However, during the FY23 process, anyone that does not have an acceptable irrigation ordinance is now ineligible for funding consideration. And they will not be moved forward through the internal review process. Um, this is a reminder, this particular item only applies to local governments and municipalities and it does not affect private entities. And that's all I have. Are there any questions? Yeah, Ms. Orlovich. Thank you so much. And uh, I just wanted to ask about um, the, the high nitrogen levels sometimes in water reuse and uh, I had asked you know how hard it would be to uh, process that out and I didn't realize how expensive it was but I just wanted to mention it because um, many people in my area who are very conscious of the nutrient pollution you know, we're excited to see the water reuse, but sometimes it seems like the sprinklers are right over a, um, like a grill, you know, that's going right down a, a drainage system. But uh, it's very exciting, and thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can you explain, when I, when I looked at the projects, so it looked like <clears throat> we had two types of projects, water supply and water conservation. Right? Correct, alternative water supply. Oh, so there were like twice as many water supply projects funded as there were water conservation projects, but the cost for the water supply was like 30 times more than the cost for the conservation. Are the water supply projects worth, do they provide that much more value? Or is it better for us to maybe identify more conservation projects that cost less but provide the same or better value? I don't know how, how you look at these things. It looked really expensive compar comparatively. Well, we do encourage water conservation because those projects, cost per dollar, cost per kgal is how we look at them. They are much more effective projects. However, in certain areas, there are some communities that have already tapped out on water conservation and there's also certain areas that they have to do some sort of alternative water supply development especially in like the central florida water initiative area where they're already doing a lot of reuse they're doing a lot of conservation but now they have to go to the florida aquifer and those projects are pretty substantially expensive especially when you're putting in deep injection wells and with the supply chain issues right now those costs are escalating even more um, but for those areas, we, you can only do so much conservation and so much reuse before you have to do some of these other larger um, reverse osmosis type. Basically what you're saying is the conservation, which is obviously less expensive, yes. can only get you so far and that you do, when you need more, when you truly need more water that beyond what conservation can get you, then Correct. you have to go into the really expensive, it gets really expensive really quick. Correct. Okay. And a lot of the utilities have tried to do as much conservation as they can or reclaimed, but then yeah. they have to resort to something else. It was just startling to me to see, because I said, well, are we not funding any conservation projects? Because the numbers are so starkly different. Then you go back and you realize, well, we fund a fair share of conservation. There just must be a lot cheaper to do. Um, they are. Well, when you're funding a conservation project where it's a rebate program, especially if they're just doing toilets or irrigation and it's $100 to $5,000 per person that they're rebating to do those types of projects, yeah, that's, it's, a, it's a huge bang for your buck to invest in those types of projects. Um, but for alternative water supply, you don't really have that option. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. So can I ask you a question about eligibility? You've, I, 
the the stick that we're sort of putting in this year really only applies to counties, local governments and municipalities. Or, or local, okay. Um, and who can individuals apply? Or? We do not fund indiv individual homeowners. Mm -hmm. So if it was like a community, an HOA or a condo association, they could apply for funding okay. if they want to retrofit their system. Yeah, that's what, that's what I want to get on the record for the public to understand that this isn't just something that you have to go to your county commissioner about. This is something that can be you know much smaller. Um, and, and more at home. Um, oh, yeah, and for the local, you know, the small HOAs and condo associations, it helps them leverage what money they have to do these smaller type projects. Right, and that, that, that includes irrigation as well as... Yes, as well indoor as and outdoor, indoor yes. Indoor and outdoor. Um, do, this is a, maybe a little odd question, but does the district, do we use this pro project internally? Uh, for our own stuff? Yep. Um, not that I'm aware of, but I know that we've done stuff with our irrigation system I, I hope here. we are. <laughs> I mean, not necessarily taking the money, but that would be nice too. But, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we, we should make sure before we're asking everyone else to do these kinds of things that we're doing things, you know, particularly we're bringing these new field stations online and, you know, we're doing a lot of construction. So I want to make well, sure that we're, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Typically with any new construction, and Jim or Mark might be able to correct me, but most new construction with the codes you have to use the lower flow right. toilets faucets if we have shower shower heads those types of things um, irrigation systems I know that we they should be using the latest technology that's out there okay no I'm just checking Hi, Mark Elzer with the water Mark. supply um, you may recall in April we do April's water conservation month and during that presentation Jim has went down through the laundry list of things we do at the district and when we got into conservation, we knew we needed to lead by example. So we did audits of headquarter, all the field stations, irrigation systems, and have went through and have done almost all the recommendations in those to at least be as efficient as possible at our facilities. Thanks. That's great. That's what I was hoping I'd hear. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Any other questions? And I guess we'll go to public comment now on this item. Do you have any public comments? I don't, Mr. Chairman. I, I think you're on the next one. <laughs> That's great. If there's no more public comment, no more board comment, well, th thanks very much, Ms. Adams. Right. Thank Appreciate you. It. We'll go now to the uh, SERP uh, land acquisition and IRL South update with Ms. Reynolds. Well, good afternoon. Today's an exciting day. <clears throat> this is the main event for the board meeting. And um, I get the honor to introduce a land acquisition for a project that's a long time coming. Um, for over 50 years, water has been discharged out of the C-25 canal uh, directly into the north end of the Indian River Lagoon. And that project has languished on the integrated delivery schedule since it was authorized in 2007. But today, you have the opportunity to change all of that. And so before we get to that main event, I wanted to take just a few moments to talk a little bit about SERP land acquisition and about the Indian River Lagoon South project. And so let's talk about SERP land acquisition just for a moment um, to kind of put things into context. As you know, SERP is a huge program that encompasses the greater Everglades across South Florida. And approximately 404,000 acres are needed to complete that entire program. <clears throat> this number includes acres that are needed to be purchased for features like reservoirs and stormwater treatment areas and canals. But it also includes acres that may be purchased or may be acquired through things like easements or other real estate agreements while ownership is maintained by others, either public or private. And so that number includes both of those types of things. Um, that type of acquisition may be appropriate for things like natural areas or areas of increased hydro period and areas where changed water levels are due to operational modifications. And as you know, land acquisition takes time. And it takes um, different mechanisms of <coughs> funding streams. And so 
Um, because of that timeline required for Stephen's team to work with Leslie Waugh's team in SERP and with Sandy Smith's team um, of engineer designers, we have to look at land acquisition ahead of the design schedule on the integrated delivery schedule. And that used to be sort of easy, uh, but now with the momentum that we have and the funding that's available uh, in this program, both on the federal side and on the state side, it's become really important for us to stay ahead of land acquisition. And so it's really exciting to be able to bring this to you today. And so I wanted to remind you of where we are on the integrated delivery schedule. How does this all fit together and why am I showing you this? Um, we're in design, construction, or operations of every single aspect of the Indian River Lagoon South project. That wasn't true five years ago. And so this is really exciting. Um, and one of the things that we did in this integrated delivery schedule is we moved all of C25 to our side of the ledger. And so this was split between the district and the core previously. And what you saw in previous schedules is that the stormwater treatment area was originally on the core side of the ledger for the schedule. And we pulled that to our side of the ledger. ledger. And with this land acquisition, we'll be able to start design and go into construction concurrently with both the stormwater treatment and the stormwater treatment area and the reservoir for the C25 project. And so I just want to remind you of the components of the Indian River Lagoon South project. And so the map is actually tinier than I would have liked, and it's probably harder for you to see than I would have liked. But um, let me just talk you through this a little bit. So you can see, um, maybe you can see it down here. Maybe I can see it down here. <laughs> OK. So <clears throat> this is the C44 canal, right? All right, it's hard to see. Um, so the C44 canal down here, the C24 canal, correction, the C23 canal into the middle estuary, the C24 canal, and then the C25 canal. And so what I just wanted to point out here is that all of these, you know, feed unnatural freshwater discharges into the Indian River Lagoon, into the St. Lucie River, the St. Lucie Estuary, and we now have projects in design and construction, and we have some projects that have already finished, I'm going to talk about those in just a second, um, that are really delivering the benefits to the Treasure Coast that were envisioned in SERP. And so going back to the 1990s, when this was all only a vision, it's now becoming reality. And it's becoming reality in projects that are finishing, projects that are under construction, projects that are in design, and with today's acquisition will be projects that are moving from just a concept into the reality of, of pre-engineering and design. So let's walk through these just real quickly. The C44, this is the bird's eye view. And in about one week, <laughs> you all will be standing right here in the VIP seats to get a front seat view of this reservoir in action. Um, as you know, the C44 stormwater treatment area is already online and operational. And the reservoir is going through testing and filling as we speak. And you'll get to see that next Friday. And so the Corps is super excited to share that with all of us. And we're looking forward to um, really celebrating in that event with them a week from Friday. The C23 and C24 reservoirs and stormwater treatment area, the Corps awarded their construction contract for the C23, C24 stormwater treatment area in September. They issued the notice to proceed to their construction contractor at the end of October. And so we'll start to see 
that construction underway very shortly on the stormwater treatment area. The reservoirs are currently in design and will go into construction in the coming years. And then you'll see down here, this last item is the communication tower. We are actually designing and constructing that con communication tower at the site and that allows us to connect the telemetry between these features to our control room so that Su Lin and her team can operate this remotely um, from our operations center and ensure that we have all of the data feeding into our systems. And so that's what that last item on this slide is about. And for the main event, this is that C25 canal that's been discharging and putting additional nutrients into the Indian River Lagoon for decades and decades and decades. And now we have the opportunity to transition from the yellow book and a conceptual design into real engineering design and construction of a reservoir and stormwater treatment area to serve this basin on the north end of the Indian River Lagoon South project. And so before we turn over to uh, Stephen for the main event, I just wanted to remind you that you will have the opportunity to vote on this item three separate times. There's a process that we have to go through. First, you'll vote on amending the Florida Forever Work Plan, and that's necessary because we're going to use Florida Forever funds in order to um, purchase this land. And so we have a work plan that requires us to explain how we're using those funds. And the reason that we have to amend it as Stephen will explain to you, is because we're shifting the uh, footprint of this reservoir about one mile west. And that has to do with the land acquisition that's available. Um, it's a much better place. Instead of having canals that run through the piece of property, we're moving it um, slightly to the west so that the canals are not running through the middle of where we want to put a stormwater treatment area or a reservoir. And it also allows us to purchase this land from just one owner, one owner instead of having it divided between multiple owners. The second time that you will get to vote on this item will be for the actual land purchase. And then the third item that you'll be voting on is allowing us to actually ask DEP for the funds in accordance with the Florida Forever plan. And so those are the three voting items that you will have uh, for this item. The other thing that I wanted to mention to you is that you'll see here and in uh, Stephen's presentation that the original project implementation report for this project anticipated a little over 900 acres needed for a reservoir and stormwater treatment area. What we're actually purchasing is a little over 1,500 acres. This is really exciting, and our design team is really um, already looking forward to an opportunity to look at how to maximize the use of those 1,500 acres to deliver the most benefits for this project. And so we're gonna look at different ways to combine the reservoir and stormwater treatment area in order to deliver the maximum benefits with those um, acres available. And so we'll take a look at maybe more treatment, more storage, a little bit more of both, more cost-effective storage. All of those things will be on the table as we look at design going into the project. And so, Chairman, I will turn it back over to you to open the public hearing that allows us to amend the Florida Forever Work Plan and use the Florida Forever Funds for this acquisition. Great. Thanks very much. So the public and the board are gonna have an opportunity to comment during and after the public hearing. So we appreciate the public interest and of course we're listening to you and while there are three comment opportunities to comment on the various components of this item, we ask that you only comment during the first public comment period if your comment is general in nature. Um, you don't have to comment each time with the same comment. We'll get it the first time. 
Uh, agenda item 31A is a public hearing to modify the South Florida Water Management District five-year Florida Forever Work Plan contained in Chapter 6A, Volume 2 of the 2021 South Florida Environmental Report to change the Indian River Lagoon South SERP project component boundaries by moving the initial C25 reservoir and stormwater treatment area component boundary about one mile to the west and increasing the originally planned acres from 904 acres to 1,583.29 acres, more or less, all located in St. Lucie County. We'll start with staff's presentation, then we'll hear public comment from those who have submitted comment cards, followed by those on Zoom with raised hands. Each speaker is going to be limited to three minutes as usual. Um, questions from the board will then follow. The public hearing is now open. Mr. Collins. Thank you, Chairman Goss. I finally know how Rocky Balboa felt. Although, as I look at the picture, it doesn't look like Rocky. <laughs> I stand before you today seeking governing board approval of the proposed board action to amend the 2021 Florida Forever Work Plan that was included in the South Florida Environmental Report filed in March of this year. Today's request for a proposed amendment to modify the boundary of the C25 Reservoir and Stormwater Treatment Area component located, is located within the Indian River Lagoon South Project. The purpose of this public hearing is to propose a boundary change on the lands located in St. Lucie County relative to the C25 Reservoir SCA so that Florida Forever Surplus Funds and or Land Acquisition Trust Funds can be used for this acquisition. As Jennifer indicated, the, the original project footprint in the PRR, which was approved in 2007, called for 904 acres of land. It consisted of multiple ownerships and bisected two large canals. By moving the project approximately one mile to the west, you can see the original PRR boundary in yellow and the new proposed boundary in red. We can increase the footprint size from 904 acres to 1,583 acres. We're dealing with one owner and a single tract. And the increase in size and, and the rectangular shape of the project provides more options and flexibilities for project design and functionality. As a statutory requirement of the Florida Forever Work Plan amendment process, because this, this property is located in St. Lucie County, the St. Lucie County Commission was officially notified of the planned project modifications and this public hearing is being held to officially modify the project and its components. With that, Chairman Goss, I, I present to you the first of three resolutions for your consideration. Uh, thank you, Mr. Collins. We'll now go to public comment. Rosie, is there any public comment on this? Yes, Mr. Chairman. St. Lucie County Commissioner Franny Hutchinson, followed by Mark Satterley, and then Nyla Pipes. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Franny Hutchinson with St. Lucie County Commission, and thank you for allowing us to be here. This has been a long day coming. And Jennifer, you were right. This is the main event for today. But in St. Lucie County, it's one of three main events with the coordination and the partnership that both the management district, along with the Army Corps and the county, have met together and worked together over all these years in regards to the C-23-24, the 10 Mile Creek Reservoir, and now the C-25. So Mr. Chair, if you'll just allow me maybe one extra minute. Um, Ma'am, you're not on the clock. You can take all okay. the time you want. Oh, With, within you don't reason. want to offer me that one. <laughs> <laughs> the C-25 projects were authorized in 2007 word of bill as a component of SERP and have been patiently awaiting the funding since then. We applaud the district in taking the lead on the entirety of the C-25 project delivery, including this land purchase action and the next two items you'll be voting on, the future design and the construction. We in St. Lucie County are excited that the C-25 project has been accelerated by two years. This will we and <laughs> we in St. Lucie County will be playing paying close attention to make sure those timelines are met. Anyone who has visited the Port of Fort Pierce during these discharges has witnessed the tragic and heartbreaking dark plumes of fresh water 
clashing against the saline waters of the lagoon. This C25 project will help to curb the harmful discharges of excess surface water at Taylor Creek into the Indian River Lagoon. And this is a first critical step. The C25 canal, since its completion in the 1960s, has, has contributed to the accumulation of muck, reduction in seagrass coverage, and overall health degradation of the lagoon. Critically endangered species, such as the Johnson seagrass, have been found growing at the confluence of Taylor Creek and the lagoon, and that habitat is worth protecting. I want to take a moment to remind you that you're not in this alone. The county has been lockstep in agreement with the goals of SERP, and I think many of you have heard my words in the past and will probably continue to hear them. And our actions in St. Lucie County speak volumes. At this very moment, St. Lucie County is dredging muck once again from the downside stream side of C25 at Taylor Creek for the third time. And I want to thank you for having been the local sponsor for the fine grant that helped us to get there. The county over the years has completed neighborhood retrofits along the C25 for the past 20 years, investing over $20 million of our county taxpayer dollars towards reducing the urban runoff. We have partnered with the city of Fort Pierce to provide stormwater treatment and utility expansions along 2nd Street, the main roadway into the Port of Fort Pierce, which has led to an economic expansion, bringing in director as a mega yacht full service retrofit facility. And we recently completed our port master plan. Taylor Creek, which takes all the discharges coming off the C-25, runs right behind, beside that, that um, port. The county has once again stepped up and has programmed over $19 million in future stormwater improvements over the next five years, much of which will complement the C-25 upon its completion. And we look forward to that continued partnership. Now from Franny's heart. I told you, don't give me those extra minutes. I'll take advantage of them. There was a lot said today, starting from the beginning of the meeting, and I'm glad I was here to sit through all of it. But the one key point that I walked away at lunchtime when we broke was the reinforcement continuously throughout the day of partnership. So from St. Lucie County and from Franny's heart, as many times as we may have had rough words, but we've sat together and plotted, I would like to thank the partnership with the water management and just as importantly with the core. We have come together, once again, can complete a whole lot more stuff that's been long waiting. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Lalibish has a statement she would like to read right now. Please. Thank you. Thank you first, uh, thank you to Commissioner Franny Hutchinson. I have tears in my eyes and um, thank you for being here today and for all your years of getting us here. Um, I have a statement from a hero uh, of our area, Congressman Brian Mast, who couldn't be here today, but asked me to read this regarding uh, item 31 C25. This project is critical to protecting the Indian River Lagoon and St. Lucie River by helping to prevent nutrient-filled runoff from entering our waterways. Congress has provided record levels of funding to support the Indian River Lagoon South projects and the acquisition of land by South Florida Water Management District for the C-25 Reservoir will be another critical step forward Thanks to the leadership of Governor Ron DeSantis in the South Florida Water Management District, Florida is making historic progress toward cleaner water for all Floridians. Representative Brian Mast, thank you. Thank you. Mark Satterley, recognized to speak, followed by Nyla Pipes. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Governing Board. Um, <clears throat> Mark Satterley, I'm Deputy County Administrator for St. Lucie County. I've worked for the county for 15 years. I've worked with Franny Hutchinson all those, most of those years, and uh, know how passionate, <clears throat> excuse me, she is about, about these water quality issues. Um, and just the only thing I would like to add, you know, again, thanking everybody for the support. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bartlett, for reaching out to us, inviting us here today. But I will tell you that in, in 2018, uh, the voters of St. Lucie County uh, passed a half-penny surtax on themselves for infrastructure. And the theme of that effort was better roads, more sidewalks, and cleaner rivers. And we had to go out and educate the public about, about those issues. And one of the pictures that we used was the plume coming out of the C-25 canal. And I think that really helped underscore the importance you know, of, of helping address some of these water quality issues that we have in St. Lucie County. So really appreciate the board's effort today and the invitation here, and thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Satterley. Nyla Pipes, One Florida Foundation, and proud St. Lucie County resident. My son attended both middle school and high school um, through a program, a magnet program with Harbor Branch. As a result of that, I have spent a lot of time seine netting in the Indian River Lagoon, exactly in this region where the C-25 dumps into the lagoon. I also spend my Saturdays, like many, many people in St. Lucie County, out at the Cove. Some people call it Dynamite Point because that's where they used to train the frogmen for World War II. The Cove is our sandbar. It is a destination. It is a part of our tourism. And it is right there at the Fort Pierce Inlet. And you'll hear me talking about the Indian River Lagoon and, and Fort Pierce and the fact that we happen to have some of the cleanest water on the entire Indian River Lagoon. And that is true to a point, mostly because we happen to have a large inlet that is very, very close uh, to the C-25. So unfortunately, what that also means, in addition to the harm to the Indian River Lagoon that these discharges cause, we are harming our nearshore reefs, our oculina coral. This is a really important project. You guys will hear me come up here and talk about the need to handle things in our local basins, and this is a poster child for the kind of project that we need, uh, specific to St. Lucie County, and definitely going to be such a good move for the Indian River Lagoon. So I can't say much more other than I hope that you support this, do everything that you can to fund it, get it built, let's improve everything for our estuary, our nearshore reefs, our tourism, our native fisheries. There's a lot on the line here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pipes. I have one raised hand, Mr. Chairman, and that's Mike Connor. Mr. Connor, you're recognized to speak. Yes, thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, Mike Connor, Indian Riverkeeper, also a St. Lucie County resident. Um, on the C-25, it's, very, it's been a long time coming. It's excellent news. We finally stand a chance to double, also to double the spatial footprint of that project. Uh, more bang for the buck as always. You know, the outlet, as we all know, and the previous speaker, and Isle Pipes mentioned the C-25, Taylor Creek. You know, over the years, Taylor Creek has been overshadowed by Lake Okeechobee discharges and uh, big pollution events like that in the southernmost end of our lagoon. But this feature, this canal, Taylor Creek, is has a hand in so much seagrass decimation that canal and the outflow and the uh, unabated um, addition of sediments, the dark water, you know, it's right in proximity with a great big inlet. It's so puzzling sometimes. Uh, we get that good flush there, a better flush possibly than the St. Lucie Inlet. Yet, yet all the, the world-renowned seagrass flats in that vicinity, uh, and as far south as Middle Cove or maybe the power plant, you know, I fished quite a bit over the last 25 years here. And in the really wet times, you would have this battle of discharges. You'd have the St. Lucie uh, River discharging for Lake Okeechobee. That plume would go north, well north of Jensen Beach. You run north to find clean water times like that, and you'd hit another wall. 
you'd hit that dark water from the Taylor Creek outfall. Sometimes when situations, winds out of the north strong in the wintertime, when there was some local rain, you would actually have the Taylor uh, Creek plume meet the plume from the south and your whole lagoon was black. And the whole area, by no no coincidence, the grass has uh, has been decimated. Bear Point, uh, all the way down to Middle Cove, the area right at the inlet, Jim Foot, all the areas up to the moorings, uh, the whole area, Harbor Branch, North, even far, as far as Vero Beach, that Taylor Creek outfall has had a big hand in destroying the seagrasses there and up, disrupting the salinity. Um, it's it used to be the greatest um, spotted sea trout fishery in Florida and uh, as, a, as an iconic species there. And, and that fishery is in horrible crisis situation uh, as far as bad spawns. Uh, Dr. Grant Gilmore, resident of St. Louis County, who most of you know, uh, doesn't hear trout anymore. In his nighttime uh, hydrophone uh, tests, the spawning sea trout drum very loudly. Uh, in the last two years, he tells me that it's almost, uh, it's almost the silence is now deafening, uh, which is very troubling. So it's great that this project is going to get done. Uh, I, I hope this project will retain as much water as possible, uh, not just the cleansing side of this project, but uh, keep as much fresh water out of the lagoon as possible. Because the, again, Taylor Creek, Taylor Creek's had a heck of a big hand in this problem, C25 discharges. And uh, I thank you for your time and we look forward to uh, the same that you will acquire as much land as possible, secure that funding, make it reality, because reality is the health of the IRL depends greatly on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Mr. Chairman, I do not have any more raised hands. Great. Thank you all very much for your comments. Uh, now we'll go to uh, board member uh, questions or discussion. And seeing none, I'm sure that Mr. Olipich, I'm sorry, Mr. Butler. Go ahead. Do you want me to make a motion? Yeah, Ben, ben that's right. I'll you, you, I'll make, Ben's I'd my like, new parliamentarian. I'd like I gotta... to make a motion so we can properly go into discussion, please. <laughs> Would you like to move the, uh, I'm going to move to modify the South Florida Water Management District five year for Florida Forever Work Plan contained in Chapter 6A, Volume 2 of the 2021 South Florida Environmental Report as per resolution number 2021-1114. I would. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Bergeron. Mr. Butler. Now, the maker of the motion, Jackie, you have the right to speak first. But uh. Since we're almost related, I'll let you go. <laughs> this is getting way too formal. <laughs> um, th th this, is, uh, this is exciting for me, too. As a kid, I grew up. When we recreated, we went to North Hutchison Island. My grandparents, butlers, had the uh, they had a condo Tierra, well Harbor, Harbor something first, and then they moved to Tierra, and um, and we kept the boat at Taylor Creek Marina. Unbelievable. And uh, little twenty foot wheel craft, and um, and still to this day, when we go to recreate on the in the Atlantic, we go to Fort Pierce, and uh, hang out in the cove. Um, but, uh, so this is kind of special to me just, and I never realized, you know, I mean, Taylor Creek Marina, I just, I, I never put together the darker water, that kind of thing until the service here on the board. And, uh, so this is kind of, you know, th this is, this is neat for me too. So. Thanks Mr. Butler. Mr. Olipich, you have any comments? Um, I, I will just say, uh, that it, Years ago, when my husband and I started flying over the St. Lucie River, Indian River Lagoon, and sharing these photos that we were taking, and of course, generally speaking, it was always about Lake Okeechobee, because we started with the EAA Reservoir. Well, there was this one picture that I took of C-25, like uh, Commissioner Hutchinson is talking about, and her staff, and I mean, it was so awful looking, and that picture became the poster child. And for all those years, people would come to the rallies with that picture saying it was Lake Okeechobee, but it was the C-25, because when it looks bad up there, you would not believe the amount of dark water pollution and sediment going into those beautiful waters. So um, this, this is incredibly special. 
And uh, I know we've gotten a little off track here, but I think we're all really excited to be part of this today. So um, I, I move this resolution, and thank you. Vice okay. Chair. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is the time. I guess there's three opportunities at this point to do, but I, I feel like let's just trains left the station here, so <laughs> let's uh, let's make a comment. Um, it does seem that since we have have joined uh, forces on the board together, that there have has been a lot of movement uh, of a lot of projects. I think that it cannot be neglected, uh, and I think it deserves to be mentioned that the leadership from the governor. Uh, on day one, yes. I think earlier, um, you know, the executive order 1912 was mentioned. But the thing that I found more interesting about 1912 uh, compared to a lot of other uh, directives from, from lawmakers and whatnot, it, you know, there are aspirational uh, phrases like achieving more. And then it sort of takes on a little bit of a different meaning when, when the Governor DeSantis puts on the, the last word achieving more now right it, it's it's a it, it's a it's a little turner phrase but it's so critically important because it puts you in a downhill posture to getting things done and i asked sean uh to pull because i was curious um the numbers of projects that we have either a broken ground or started on uh since january of 2019 or moved from one phase to the next phase or, you know, uh, completed, which I think is, you know, as cool as it gets. Um, you know, we've been on the board now. It's not been, uh, it's not been 36 months, so it's been something less than 36 months at this point. Um, we already have 21 Everglades restoration projects that have either broken ground, hit a mi major milestone, or finished uh, construction. I'm going to read them into the record because I think it's just... It's pretty awesome. Um, we have broken ground or started uh, projects, uh, six projects. The EAA uh, Reservoir, the project stormwater treatment area. Uh, we have started on the eight and a half square mile area seepage wall. Uh, the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Projects, aquifer storage and recovery wells and land acquisition uh, for the wetland restoration components. Um, we have broken ground on the C-139 flow equalization basin, on the C-139 annex restoration phase two and agricultural area stormwater rerouting, uh, and on restoration strategies, Bowles East Canal conveyance improvements segment four. That's six projects that have, have broken ground or started. Um, in terms of moving to the next phase, we engage the final phase of construction for the Caloosahatchee Reservoir, C-43. Um, we are presumptively going to approve the C-25 reservoir STA um, for, for land acquisition completing and moving into the design phase. The Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project, um, SEP North moved into design. S332B and 332C pump station replacements are in design, and the Lake, lake uh, Hikpachi expansion, which is in design for November 2020. The, we have completed nine projects. Um, the Caloosahatchee Reservoir Water Quality Study Analysis, the Brighton Valley Dispersed Water Management Project, uh, the Scott Water Farm Project, which just came online, the Bluefield Grove Water Farm Project, the S191A pump station uh, to support Lakeside Ranch STA, the Kissimmee River restoration, a beautiful photograph that we, uh, we just saw in uh, Lawrence's report. C44 Reservoir and STA, um, the old Tamiami Trail removal, which I think um, probably got Mr. Bergeron a few more hours of sleep at night. <laughs> and the, um, the S333N, the SEP South projects. I mean, you know, it's, it's worth noting how much is either completed or on the way, and it's very exciting to me, and, and this is just another, um, you know, exciting moment for us, but it's, uh, you know, it's, to me, it's just an exhilarating uh, time to be involved in this after hearing so many people who have worked so hard over the years, um, you know, not really see too many things come to fruition, and, and here we are doing all these wonderful things, so 
That's my comment. No, thanks very much, Vice Chair. And I, I think. Uh, one. Hang on just a sec, Mr. Bergeron. I think, I think your your implied mm -hmm. sentiment there, as well as the accolades to the governor, it'd probably be accolades to the staff for for pulling all this off. Because the governing board, you know, we we meet once a, once a month, and we don't do all this stuff. So. <laughs> we, we, we cut a lot of ribbons and we, we cut a lot, a lot of ribbons. Of dirt. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my, my hat's off to the staff for doing this. Uh, Mr. Bergeron. Well, I have to agree with you, Mr. Chairman. Our staff is unbelievable. And, and, you know, the governor's leadership, the legislator's leadership, the type of funding uh, that's going into Everglades Restoration. Con Congressman Mask uh, has been, been in the fight with all of this. And I think this project is extremely important. We've all sit here for several years and seen the impacts that the East Coast has suffered. Um, and the thing that I see as we've been moving through these projects, we've been able to look at projects that are creating the most irreversible damage first as we proceed through the largest environmental restoration in the history of the world. And, and this is a great day for, for the East Coast and St. Lucie. And I'm really happy for you, Jackie, because you've worked very hard on all of this. Thank and you. Uh, it's all important. And it's a great day for the Everglades. And uh, I'm very honored to, to be a, a part of it with all of you and our staff. Thanks, Mr. Bergeron. With that, I'm going to call the question. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Meads. Yes. Mr. Olipich. Yes. Vice Chair Wagner. Yes. Mr. Butler. Yes. Colonel Roman. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Martinez. That's a yes. Great. And I'm going to vote yes. And that's a, that's a unanimous passage. And congratulations. And the public hearing is now closed. One down, two to Mr. go. Mr. Collins, thank you. One down, two to go. I'm now going to ask the governing board for authorization of the second. Second. Um, authorize the purchase, right? The purchase authorize offer. The purchase, uh, the second resolution to authorize the purchase of the, HP, uh, the modified project site. So just so we all are level set and starting on the same page, we're talking about the C-25 Reservoir Stormwater Treatment Area and the Indian River Lagoon South CERT project. The site is approximately 1,583.29 acres, and all the acres are going to be acquired from one seller, HBH Groves LLC. It's currently being occupied as an operating citrus grove. The purchase price is $15,890,000. The current owner is retaining the right to occupy the property until June of next year in order to complete its harvest of the current crop. There's a replacement bridge being built right now, and the owner retain, the current owner is retaining, occupancy, retaining ob, the obligation to complete that bridge and in the, in the interim provide access through a bridge to the east. And with that, I present a resolution approving the acquisition for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Is there any public comment on this one? Rosie? No, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Any board questions or discussion on this one? Let's go ahead and get a motion um, to approve resolution 2021-1115. I'm going to let someone else make that motion since we're all a I'll part of this. I'll move. Thank you. I'll Vice second Chair. it. Thank you. Is that Colonel Roman? Yes, Thank Charlotte, you. yeah. Thank you for the second. Uh, further board discussion? Hearing none. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Ms. Meads? Yes. Sir Olipich? Yes. Vice Chair Wagner? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Colonel Roman? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Yes. yes. I'm going to vote yes, and that passes unanimously as well. Thank you. Mr. Collins? Items 31C? That's okay. 
I'm asking the governing board to consider approving the resolution for funding. This is to request the release of funds from the land acquisition trust fund and or the use of Florida Forever Surplus funds for the acquisition of the C-25 reservoir project. So moved. Hang on, I gotta go to public comment first. <laughs> is there any public comment? No, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Butler. I move the resolution. Mr. Butler moves the resolution. Second. Mr. Martinez seconds. Is there further board discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Meads is now back in the room. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Meads. Yes. Mr. Olipich. Yes. Vice Chair Wagner. Yes. Mr. Butler. Yes. Colonel Roman. Yes. Mr. Martinez. Yes. And I'm going to vote yes, and that passes unanimously as well. Thank you very much, and congratulations. That's a great day. And I, I can't, I can't wait to see what this does. Can I, can I make a quick comment? Yes. Of course. I just want to note at Steve Collins. Steve. I just want to recognize Steve Collins, who I think is one of the most understated, mild-mannered, consummate professionals uh, inside the district here. Uh, he is always well-prepared. Uh, he's always on point. Um, he does his work, I think, under the radar a little bit. Uh, and I think it was a little bit of a subtle, rocky reference because this was a back and forth serious negotiation on a very important piece of land and I think Steve should be recognized for it. Um, I've had several instances where I've had an opportunity to call Steve. Uh, in fact, one where I, and I may have mentioned this before, I, I didn't realize that how early it was. Sometimes I lose track of time and so I, I, I just called Steve at the office at like 7.30 a.m. one day or 7 o'clock and I realized it was a little bit early. And I was just going to leave him a voice message. But no, that phone rang on the first <laughs> ring. He picked it up at his station. He, he's, he's a great, great guy. And I, I just I think you deserve uh, some serious recognition for your efforts. I second so thanks. that. Me too. And I, I want to remind everyone how it was either our first meeting or our second meeting. Poor Stephen had to stand right there or right there while we tore him into little bitty pieces for like an hour and he's so professional that he just did it and took it and didn't let it bother him and has just he's just spectacular he is the best and you do such a great job with the real estate thank you i'd like to say also due to their expertise and Look, we're ending up with 1,500 acres instead of 900 acres, more protection for St. Lucie County, uh, which is well needed. Uh, most people would just, okay, we got 900 acres, let's just move forward. But they went way beyond the call of duty to, to even increase uh, the protection for the East Coast. And uh, I compliment our staff tremendously. Yeah. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Good job, all. All right, we'll move on now to item number 32, which is staff reports, and we'll go to uh, the monthly financial report with Ms. Heater. Good afternoon. So the monthly financial report in your packet is through the month of September, so the end of the year for fiscal year 21. Um, they are unaudited right now. Your staff in finance is uh, going through an audit. Um, of the 21, you know, financials. Um, but we did end the year on a positive. We collected 98% of our revenues. Um, we collected $63 million more in state revenues than we did the prior year, so in 20. So that is a testament to all of the construction uh, going on. Um, we also, you know, executed and spent $182 million more than the prior year. So this is all uh, good, good metrics of dollars behind all the words that were said today. Um, I also want to note that we did receive our 
uh, DOR notification, Department of Revenue notification that we were found in compliance with our trim process. And that is a um, very you know, positive and good thing because that means we may continue on for fiscal year 22 to collect our, <laughs> our ad valorem funds as well as our state revenues. If you are found in non-compliance, you have to forfeit your state funds as well. So it is a lot of pressure. So um, the budget staff uh, did a very good job. So. That concludes my report. Congratulations on that. <laughs> uh, any comments or questions for Ms. Heater? Thanks very much, Katie. Thank you. We'll go now to the general counsel's report. Um, in for Ms. Anse is Ms. Levine. Yes, there is nothing to report this month, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Levine. Uh, we'll go now to a general public comment. Rosie, is there any general public comment? We have one, Mr. Chairman, Newton Cook. Nothing like better than a lawyer to tell me that they don't have anything to report. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's a classic, I want you to know. <laughs> it's been a long day. What a wonderful thing with this land acquisition. I'll never live to see it, but hunting on it, but someday we'll be out there. There'll be guys out there, and, and ladies, I might add, too. So the district just does such wonderful work, and the top to bottom. And uh, our recreation meeting coming in December, uh, I, I just sat there and marvel at the good things that are reported. I got phone calls yesterday. The SDA's just heartbreaking. I, I mean, I, I have to tell you, it is just heartbreaking because there's nobody cares more about marshes and wetlands and, and duck hunters. And we had scouting, we had scouting day. It's, and it's not anyone's fault here because the storm caught us last year. Last year, that storm, it, all that water down south really finished the job after the lake had already started it. But it's sad when the WCAs are in better shape than the SCAs. And we dropped a couple of billion dollars on those SBA, SCAs. And I don't know what to tell you to do, but they were working pretty good back in the days when we had a third cattails, a third mix, and a third in SAV. Uh, I know a couple of them I see are rebounding a little bit, but that's a sale. That is not the whole, the whole place. Uh, one East, for example, has got one sale that's working. I don't think five has any that's working. And there's a lot of construction out there, and, 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 and we understand why. It's because the SDAs are in trouble. That's why you're having so much instruction, construction. We understand that. But to end on the top, on a good note, I want to thank uh, Jim Harbaugh and uh, from here and the FWC, uh, Justin. We made a tour of Lakeside, SDA, another SDA. Now, Lakeside is not like the SDA south of the lake. You expect it to go all cattails because that's water that is not part of the cleaning the water before it goes south part. But there are some open water areas out there, and we might have a potential to do some what we call pop-up hunts where we can, uh, commission has a way of putting some quotas into the system for the next week and that type of thing. So some of this will be discussed at the recreation meeting. And I want to thank the group that's also going to be cleaning the area in front of the uh, handicap blind at SDA 5. And if it wasn't for you people, we couldn't all get it done because you have to have that special cutter. Uh, sad story, I, I'm not going to tell you, but the reason why the whole area in front of the blind is nothing but just cattails is because of the way the water's been running through there the last few years. But thanks for everything you do. We don't expect anything. We're happy to get what we get. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Nyla Pipes. I just couldn't end the day without saying thank you. That's all I needed. Nyla Pipes, One Florida Foundation. We appreciate you very much. Thank you, Ms. Pipes. Mr. Chairman, I do not have any raised hands. 
Thanks, Rosie, and thank you all for your comments. We'll go now to board uh, comment, and then uh, the Audit and Finance Committee will be meeting after our meeting. Uh, Mr. Bergeron. Well, first of all, thank all my fellow board members. But, yeah, you know, when I sit up here and listen to everybody, um, there's uh, in, in their different areas and, and how we bring this thing together, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to work with all of you. But we're, um, and also want to thank uh, the, our new Colonel, um, and you too, Colonel Polk. Okay, <laughs> baby alligator. I, look, <laughs> I uh, look forward to working with y'all on all these <clears throat> important issues that we're all uh, working on. <laughs> Um, and our staff, thank all of you. You're, you're, you're the best to bring, to bring this together. You know, as we're uh, taking care of nine million people in South Florida, you know, flood protection, water supply, our environment, our quality of life for future generations. Um, it, it's so great to work with you. And, and how we're accomplishing everything we're accomplishing. Uh, and I, can't, I just want to say I miss uh, Mike Collins, yeah, you know. I always look forward to Mike coming up here with, with all of his uh, intellectual knowledge over all these years, and we're going to miss Mike, but uh, we'll... Uh, <clears throat> But um, <clears throat> you know, it's hard when you lose somebody that's uh, <clears throat> part of this whole family. Um, but we'll um, <clears throat> make him proud to the day we we join him. And, um, and I want to thank the staff for moving forward on on the evaluation of the L28, moving water south. Uh, getting through that barrier on the western side of uh, uh, Central Everglades and, and moving water to the 10,000 islands. Uh, we've been modeling, uh, getting water moving uh, southwest naturally. Uh, interesting as we've been, our staff has been looking at that, as you can see from a satellite aerial, the, the ridge and sloughs and the actual natural flowway that's being blocked by the L-28 and modeling uh, the Tamiami Trail to make sure that that water continues to flow south uh, and modeling um, uh, so we, we have that uh, continuous flow. Um, so I wanna thank staff as we continue to move forward. Uh, next year we should be able to see what we need and uh, more water south and less water east and west. It's, uh, and I, I also want to thank the governor and all our legislators uh, and Brian Mass and all of uh, the support they've given us to be like, like you said, Scott, you know, you, you read off a dozen projects and that we've been able to be a part of. Hmm? 21. 21, yeah. Well, I don't want to cut you short then. <laughs> but <laughs> Cutting yourself short. But that, that wouldn't be possible without our staff and without uh, the leadership of our governor and, and our legislators. So uh, it's a great honor for me to be sitting here with all of you, and I look forward to continuing to uh, uh, long live the Everglades. Amen. Thanks, Thank Mr. You. Bergeron. Ms. Meads. Group, di group dynamics, the so social science of group dynamics, right? You foreman, storman, and norman. So I remember two years ago or so when we were foreman, right? And the stakeholders looked at us. I'm sure I can only guess, you know, if you were in my hometown, I would know exactly what you were saying behind my back because we're so small. 
we can hear each other from porch to porch. We sit and we can hear the neighbors down the way talking. But you must have said they don't know anything. You know, what has the governor done to us? He's given us all these people. They don't know anything, and I'm not happy about this. Blah, blah, blah. Storming. Remember in the beginning where we all kind of felt a little stick in our stomach? I said something to, to Ms. Reynolds that caused her to a actually deservedly snap at me. Remember when I said, why is it that the Army Corps is responsible for Lake Okeechobee when it's our lake? And you said, because you can't be trusted to do it. Remember that? <laughs> Storming. You were, the you were the nicest person on earth, and I got you to say, because you get Anyway, <laughs> Foreman, Norman, and Storm, I mean, Foreman, Storman, Norman. We're Norman now. It feels great. And all of the stakeholders who have stood up here day after day after day after day for hours, for nine hours, remember all of that? Where we were here until 7.30 at night and then had to all go find our way home? We have made it to the other side, and the stakeholders have taught us so much, so not one second of your time at that microphone has been wasted, because we have learned from you, we have listened to you, and as we all pat ourselves on the back, I want to pat you on the back for, and I, I, I mean you, Nyla, and Mike, and I don't know where Pete Quashes is. Pete and, I mean, all of you guys, thank you for everything that you've done in part of this process because you're the big winners. Thanks, Ms. Meach. Mr. Olipich. I don't know if I can follow that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last thing I have on my list is that I'm, Looking forward to seeing everybody at the C44 Reservoir in Indian Town, which will be the first major project completed uh, for SERP, which is an incredible thing. Cookies. <laughs> Cookies. <laughs> and um, it, it does feel like something great is happening here. I mean, in spite of low some, sometimes like making me feel like I'm gonna pull my hair out, I know that LOSUM is going to complement, no matter what, going to complement all the things that are happening everywhere. And these things could not be happening without the funding and the support that we are getting from our um, state and uh, uh, congressional governments, I mean, and the presidents. I mean, I want to thank everybody for every money piece that has come our way because we are spending it and we are going to fix this state. Thank you, Mr. Olish. Vice Chair. Uh, I just wanted to note something that came up during the course of the meeting that I hope we can get some more uh, detail on moving forward. This was sort of the sponge concept of moving water to Florida Bay, which for, for many moons had not really, uh, didn't, well, moving water to Florida Bay certainly came up. Um, how we got it there was uh, another story. And we talked a lot about you know, whether we could even move water over ridges and into areas that would actually get it into kind of the central Florida Bay area. We just gotta pray for you know, rain clouds to kind of gather above uh, particular areas instead. And so today, I think we heard you know, maybe for the first time here about this sort of sponge uh, situation. I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. Um, and I also, on top of that, I, I do wanna sort of understand is 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 that indeed a way that's going to create the the carry of water down south does it need do we need to saturate first and then sort of glide on top um the next question was we have over meetings i've heard a few times it mentioned but then i don't really hear too much about it which is the removal of a old road in the in Everglades National Park that's been there for a long time and nobody quite knows whether it has a function or not, but it seems like it's caught in a variety of agency, maybe webs or something like that. Um, sometimes it's weird. Uh, you hear these stories in life where, oh, that, that road that we've been talking about for, for 20 years, well, we guess what? We removed it and all, now all of a sudden the water's 
flowing or something like that. We don't know how it happened. We didn't think it was going to be that meaningful, but it was. And I just wanted to follow up to, um, doesn't have to be here, but to sort of find out more about what's going on with that process. Thanks. Thank you, Vice Chair. Mr. Butler. No final comment. Thank you all. See you in a week and see you again in Miami. I'll see you in a week. I know. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Roman. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I'm always amazed, Cheryl, by your comments. And, and I think that that was just a wonderful way to recap uh, our over two and a half years here on the board together. Today's um, a great day to be a part of the South Florida Water Management District. And it's certainly a privilege to serve with all of you. Um, that reservoir on the East Coast is going to be just amazing. And it's been a long time coming. So I'm very proud to be a part of it with you. And it wouldn't be possible without the outstanding work of our staff. The it, tremendous team spirit is just overwhelming to me today. And Vice Chair Wagner, you did a great job recapping the big picture of how far we've come. We still have a long way to go, but we have come a long way. So let's keep our eye on the ball and see where we go from here. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, ma'am. Charlie, uh, Ms. Martinez. Ms. Martinez, you on? All right, we can hear your comments next month, <laughs> or if you come back in the next five minutes. Um, so I don't have many comments. I, I would like to thank um, Vice Chair for bringing that list out. I think that was excellent, and I, I'd like to thank um, our staff because honestly, you know, we're not doing the work. And I'd like to thank uh, Drew. Uh, it's your leadership that's really making this happen. You've got a great team to, you've put together, and it's, it's really gelling. And, and we are we are storming now as a result. And, and I. I appreciate it, and I'm sure the governor appreciates it because we're, we're making some real progress that, that, you know, our constituents are being able to see, and these, these ribbon cuttings are a testament to that. So, so we'll have another one next week, and we'll keep chugging along with the ribbon cuttings. Um, one thing I would like to say, and this is a little bit sad, and I just found out at lunch, um, there's a, a gentleman named Dusty Crum. Um, you may know him as Wild Man. He's one of our python hunters. He was in a bad accident um, recently, in the last couple of days, uh, in Venice. It had nothing to do with python hunting. But uh, if your thoughts could be with him a little bit, I, I hope that uh, Dusty has a, a quick and uh, thorough recovery from uh, his injuries. Um, the Audit and Finance Committee is going to meet uh, following this meeting. Um, we're going to need a couple of minutes to uh, make a recording transition, and then I'm going to hand the gavel to uh, Ms. Thurl Lipich, um, because you'll be chairing that meeting. And um, next month, we're on the road. We're down to Miami-Dade. We'll be at uh, City of Doral Council Chambers on December the 9th. So look forward to seeing you there. There's not going to be a workshop in December, so just a regular board meeting. And uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>